All right. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all enjoyed uh, the keynote and the concert yesterday at Drogheim. And uh, before introducing our keynote this morning, I would like to tell, uh, to inform about two uh, announcements. The first one is that uh, today we will be taking the picture all together uh, before lunch, so around 12.30, and we will all go to the place where we will take the picture. Um, so please, if you uh, walk around or anything, make sure you are here at 12.30 so we can all go together to make the picture. And the second one is for all of those who have to uh, fill in the form for uh, the travel re reimbursement. Uh, there is a person from the administration at NTNU at the registration desk. So if you uh, pass by there and then uh, give her any information that she might need, uh, it would be great. So she will be here until lunch as well. And then it's uh, our big, big pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker today, who is Norbert Schnell. And it's really an honor that uh, you accepted the invitation since you are the founder of the WAC, uh, which was the first time in 2015 in Paris. And the talk today will be on our past, present, and future with web audio technologies, a participatory keynote address. Please enjoy the keynote. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess you can imagine how proud I am that we, that we are all here and WAC is still there. I mean, of course, the, the first WAC was uh, special because it was the first one, and the second was special because it was the first second one, and, you know, from the third one, we thought, well, this will be an annual thing, and then, you know, and so on. And Trondheim uh, 19, 2019 was the first one we knew where it will take place before the last one, right? We already knew in Berlin, that was the first time we, we knew in advance when it will be the next time, and we know already where it is in 2020, and it will be revealed, I mean, I guess there are rumors today, no? Today, no? I guess so, it's today. <laughs> anyway, so I'm very proud, and I would like to thank Every, uh, tomorrow it will be announced, yes. Every, every, everybody who was involved in this, and of course, there are lots of faces um, we see each year, and thank you, thank you very much of, to, to having made this an annual international conference um, that I can be so proud. Of course, I co-founded this with uh, Samuel Goldschmidt. We are here at the first work at Irkham. And, um, yeah, well, he left the field, you know, he's now working for the, maybe he's online. Hi, Samuel. I miss you. And um, <laughs> he, he left the field, he is, uh, he is uh, now working for the digital transformation of the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Energy and stuff like that. Anyway, um, so let's do this. So a participatory uh, keynote means that it's not me who speaks, but you. And um, there's already a URL. I will explain that in detail. I guess I owe you a little explanation. You know, I'm invited to prepare this keynote, and then I say, oh, no, it's you. Um, well, you know, here's the, the address. Um, I'm coming from the music side, as many of us, I guess, in this community. There may be some others. And, you know, I'm a music kinger. And um, if you don't know this citation of Christopher Small, I'm happy to, to um, file it to you. I will read it. The act of music, you know, there are two definitions of what music is, right? And this is the second, and it contains the first, which is the organized sound, of course, by um, Edgar Varese. So, the act of music king, of making music, right? establishes in the place where it is happening a set of relationships and it is in those relationships that the meaning of the act of music making lies. They, the relationships, are not, are to be found not only between those organized sounds, the chords and the melodies and the voices, which are conventionally thought of as the stuff of musical meaning, but also between the people who are taking part in whatever capacity as 
producers, listeners, performers, people showing the seats in the dark, whatever capacity in the performance. And they model or stand as a metaphor for ideal relationships between person and person, between individual and society, between humanity and the natural world, and even perhaps the supernatural world. This is what music is about, right? And if we look at our musical practices, we see weird metaphors, right? I mean, there is a, if we ignore, if we ignore this, it's almost every time a man, this man, sometimes a woman conducting, which is a metaphor of unique leadership and genius and dictatorship maybe, if we ignore that one, of course, it's a very, very beautiful metaphor of polyphony, diversity, um, collaboration, complex rule systems, and a joyful and constructive, harmonious relation, such a choir or orchestra. But you know, I've played, I can tell you, it's all fake. It's written down to the littlest detail in advance. They practice until they almost know it by heart. They read it from the paper. It's all fake. All these beautiful interactions of different voices played by different instruments are fake. Sorry to give you the bad news. What this metaphor stands for, come on. What is this here? It looks, for me, you know, I grew up in Germany. It looks like this, doesn't it? Jesus. So what about this? I think it has something of something like that, you know? It's these superheroes, super skilled, super creative, super, 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 you know? Anyway. So I'm one of the people who, who think that um, the World Wide Web makes this world a better place, despite Facebook and these things. And of course, only if, and only if, we can contain our lostness and confusion and fear from this plurality, diversity of the world, right, that is coming into our screens. Anyway, so once this is said, I of course can't stand here and give a keynote address, you know, and um, we should do this together. So my only competence in doing this I gained in the field of music, doing workshops with people, improvising with their mobile phones or um, collaborating with musical dictators make them listening to the public and give, empowering the, the audience to play little instruments and make sound all together. Um, or do an experience like this where everybody would have a mobile phone and a headphone and if you are alone in your corner you would have a little track to play or a little instrument to play and if you come close to somebody you can group and everybody hears what everybody is doing when you just stick your mobile phones together you can group together and, and jam and go to other people and, take, and, and, and create other groups and so on. Or this one is Grainfield, actually we did it the day before yesterday, right? We did an audio mostly in, in London. This is the first performance in, at the Music Tech Fest in Berlin. And we did this one, which is uh, 88 fingers that we did in London at the WAC2, where 88 people playing on the right. And anyway, this is some this is the experience I have, and from this, um, what I did is creating a little web system that allows us to collaborate uh, on this keynote together. So I count on you. There are this, the instructions. I need your help from now. Please, you will speak. The system is designed in a way that you can listen. You know, the one thing I learned from this participatory things we tried out is that participation is not so much about this active passive thing, right? It's not so much about that people you would kind of denounce as having been 
passive in a concert situation or something would now be active. It's not about that. It's about actually the attention people shift from a common object of interest towards each other. So this is all about you know, being attentive to each other instead of to me being here. I will stay a little around here to, to have an eye on the server. No, I can't see it, so I will sit down there. And um, yeah, please, please participate. Um, I can count how many people are connected. And I will just start this. Yeah, so uh, there are some people who will help with the microphone. Can you yes. come up, please? I will give you my microphone. And then it will ha hand it out to you. So we can do a little kind of rehearsal, right? So I will ask one of you, and just one of you, can you just reload the page uh, to the initialization? No, no, do, 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 you just... Do. So we have for, for now one mic open, and um, I will start this thing, and you can request... Okay, so now um, they will compete. There, there is one thing, where, one mobile phone where it's written, should have made a little bing, and there's written, um, raise your hand. Who has that? Yeah, so raise your hand, please. And then you will get a mic. <laughs> and um, then you get a question. And if you don't like it, you just push your screen and you will have another question. I, you know, this I, is just, yeah, do this, boom. I slept well. <laughs> like, you know, if you don't like a question, you, can you show uh, how you touch your screen to change the question? Yeah, and so on, right? And, uh, you know, and they're just inspired. If you want to tell us anything else, just do it, please. You know, it's a participatory keynote. It's your responsibility and your choice what you will tell us, right? And this is just, you know, for getting some inspiration, you can scroll through some questions. This is, uh, these are just the, the warm-up questions, right? We will enter the serious mode right away. And yeah, that's kind of it. So while somebody is talking, uh, other people turn on the, your audio so it makes bing, bing, bing. Don't listen to the bing, bing, bing. The system is designed that you can listen to the others and eventually it might make bing and you will ask to raise your hand and then you get a mic and then you wait that your screen is red and says you, it's your turn and then you can participate and the rest of the time you can listen to the others. This is the design criteria number one for the system, that you are, have your mind free to talk. And, you know, as the last one says, embrace doubt, hesitation, and silence. You know, if you, don't, if you don't feel that you have something to say all of a sudden, don't say anything. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's okay. We are all here. We can listen to each other breathing, and it, I think we will have a great moment, too. Okay, let's try this. So um, I will just push two buttons and won't intervene ever again. Apart from afterwards, just stop it. We have 20 minutes. I go like this. Bring up the serious questions. You enter your thing. I give you this mic. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the question. I don't like the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> the question is always there. Oh, we're always there. Okay, never here. <laughs> Ooh. 
My friends think the web audio is awesome. <laughs> it's a great feel <laughs> and uh, an awesome community, actually. I don't have green. I've got a green phone here. <laughs> you must raise your hand when it's written on your phone. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. What if you have a red phone? No, but mine is not green. It's black. So. But there's a green phone. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. Come on, guys. <laughs> this problem is very I can't do more. Sorry. Oh, it's my turn. Um, oh, that's a um, beautiful question. I have the whole uh, opportunity here. Maybe I should hand the mic over to Francisco here. Uh, Um, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, I don't know. Um, it's great to see all the art happening here, um, the music and the interesting experiments. Um, so, so the more kind of practice-based work, uh, the better, I think. Um, but of course, um, it's nice to have theory and engineering as well. Oh, uh, well, I don't know what happened. It just like turned uh, green and then, uh, uh, what should I do? Touch your screen. Doesn't work. What should I do? Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, my web audio dreams. Ah, uh, <laughs> make it a work like native. <laughs> um, my message to the web audio community. Uh, mm, maybe I will change that way. I don't know. I cannot. I don't know. Something happened. Something. Yeah. So I have to answer now, I guess. The thing you would like to change in the Web Audio API. Um, well, maybe I don't know, change, but like just make it at least like that you can make uh, add it to native. I'm doing apps with React Native. That could be cool to be able to do apps like with Web Audio. <laughs> oh. 
I have a yellow screen. A golden rod screen. Did you click? Do I hit it again? Yeah. No. Mine's like a nice mustard yellow. What is that? Anyone has a red screen? Ah, okay. okay. Because my, mine is red. Where's the red screen? Is it you? Is me? <laughs> <laughs> No, I have yes, a yellow, yellow screen. Well. So missed this, this match here. So who is the red yeah, screen? But, it's fine. but she has a please raise your hand still. Yes. Okay. So. I think is still green. I guess it is very much on the red screen. Let's embrace the doubt, hesitation, and silence. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh. oh no. What I hate. Uh, can I change question? <laughs> Oh, the sound of web audio is good, as you can see, <laughs> as you might have heard yesterday. Uh, very good examples of web audio. And I think there's a nice ecosystem of applications that can actually demonstrate that. And it's getting better with audio workload, you know, threading. Boy, I, uh, for me, how I got to know the Web Audio API was uh, through various projects that popped up online, lots of searching, and then eventually uh, Chris Lowe's um, uh, Web Audio Weekly, and just being able to find different projects and then look at what they were doing. So, question? And it's gone. Shall I just give another request? <laughs> oh. Now it's green. We're all struggling. Your web audio friends, you are all my web audio friends. I don't have anyone else in Turkey, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, so that's me. Uh, this one is tricky um, because uh, actually I think in terms of all my personal experience on on concerts using web audio, I think might be one that happened yesterday <laughs> because you know this uh, 
there was a lot of interesting things. Um, but yeah, I think that top one right now would be from uh, Thor, Chris, and Francisco, actually. Um, right now. Uh, but yeah, also, I haven't seen you know, that much web audio uh, performances, uh, web audio only based performances, but yeah. Uh, okay, something about web audio. Um, just that it's awesome. I mean, I don't think we'd all be here if it wasn't. But I think it's something really, really um, revolutionary in terms of how we can actually do stuff. It should be kind of cool. All right, uh, my current web audio projects. Well, I am try I, I did a uh, spectral an an analysis thing and I'm thinking that it would be really cool to make it on WebGL shaders. So maybe that, but also, but also trying to make an online thing where you connect to the website and really listen to stuff generated by, based on the WebSocket data. And I'm struggling with it, not really working well on mobile, just crashing. So I wish that could be better, maybe for me, or I would be better. That'd be also good. Yeah. I got my cell phone to work. So yeah, my first web audio project wasn't that long ago. Uh, it was trying to run on Pisonics and just uh, mess with it a little bit and just make a 3D feel of uh, my head. But. Uh, yeah, I think that small project is actually online, somewhere hidden in my website, but <laughs> interesting early experiments. <laughs> Oh, it's me again. Oh <laughs> how can this be? Uh, how do you explain web audio to small children? Well, um, as I would explain another framework of audio, but just on the browser, which is something everybody uses nowadays, I think. Um, it's meant to be simple also to explain to children. Yeah, you must color this thing. You know, do you have a red screen? Uh, now, now it's don't yellow. Don't if you not, don't have a red screen. So it was his turn. Yeah, but we... Anyway, no, uh, no, but it was, it was green. Yes. Yeah, but not red. When it's written, it's your turn. It's your turn. <laughs> so I should... Uh, Isn't that great? <laughs> So just, you know, if you tap on your phone, you get a new question. No, it's not me, I'm green. Uh, now, now he has raised your hand, but he had already raised Okay, so before. just let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it works if you just tap.
just on a green screen. It's green and black. Somebody must be doing it. Work assistant. That's what I do. Let's start again, though. Yeah, it's a horrible question. Yeah, choose it now. Oh, how much time have we got? Uh, I guess the main one for me of, of uh, a message, if we want to get deep and into everything, uh, is to ensure that we, we, we keep working together on this project. Um, I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to come to every single, well, all apart from the last one in Berlin, and it's, it's always incredible the amount of, of work that we all do. Um, so I guess my thing to say is just to keep ensuring that we work uh, together on trying to make this better, because I think there's still a long way to go in the standard, in browsers, in what we can all achieve. So I guess the message is, let's uh, keep keep doing this. Let's keep enjoying this. This is good fun. I like breaking stuff. Give me stuff to break. <laughs> But I um, have no question now. Yeah. My wishes. Um, so hopefully Web Audio will conquer the world uh, of audio. <laughs> <laughs> How would you explain Web Audio to your grandmother? <laughs> it's the thing we use to make music on the phone. <laughs> I'm going to answer that question. The error that I make all the time when using web audio uh, is is trusting that everybody in the audience is going to understand what I asked them to do. <laughs> I, and I don't know if that's necessarily a problem. It's just something I have to know beforehand. It was,
Okay, I actually accidentally pressed the screen, but it's fine. <laughs> and this is a good question. Your new life coding language in web audio. This gibberish, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, gibberish something thing. It was inspired by Tidal, I think. The UI was great actually, and it's nice to see like this integration of visual interface with actual live coding. I was waiting for this actually. Never tried to implement it myself, but still good to see it's done by someone else. So yeah, I mean, I guess it's a good direction for live coding, integration of like some kind of more advanced visualization with the actual text-based interface. So yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, thanks. The feature you would like to add to the web audio API the most urgently. The ability to change the tempo during the runtime. The ability to change tempo. So we, we had some presentation yesterday and uh, people were complaining about uh, the need to change the buffers when you try to play with the tempo, I think uh, that is the very useful feature for the web audio. I'm not sure if this worked. It surely um, showed two difficulties. One is to make participation run, and the other is to build a system that you know works on all smartphones and manages these requests and queues. I think there's somewhere a little bug. We had moments where it got stuck. I really have the impression and other moments where people were tired to participate. But anyway, thank you very much for this first experience I had of this genre, and you maybe too, and I think um, there is potential. Thank you very much. And now we do have two minutes to make any question to Norve before uh, going to the next uh, speakers. Is there any question? All right, so I guess we can. Uh, do you have any special announcements?
Carlos. Mary ready. So the journal is Audio Engineering Society. Yeah. yeah. The Journal of Audio Engineering Society. Oh. Hi. It works. It's working. It's working. Yeah. I'm not sure. Can you hear you? Can you hear me? Okay. Go. Um, so thank you, Norbert, for this wonderful meditation time. <laughs> and now we feel relaxed as a family. So um, I'm from, uh, I'm representing here Graham uh, Musical Creation Center from France, Lyon. And here's Michel Bifa from University of Côte d'Azur. Uh, so we are here to present you our new false IDE. Uh, and how to develop web audio plugins with it. So, um, Faust, it's not a, just another program language. It's the uh, program language for very complex DSPs. Uh, so, Faust is a um, functional, synchronous, domain specific programming language uh, designed for real time audio progressing and synthesis since 2002. And uh, FOSS is also a multi-language code generator, uh, which will allow you to um, export DSPs for many other audio platforms just using the same code. So um, recently, um, um, our grant team and with some Karma guys, we uh, developed a lot of robust uh, DSPs in FOSS, uh, such as uh, physical modeling or uh, simulations of analog devices. So um, these are all open source. So if you want to use them, just learn FOST. So um, if, using, if you are using FOST for um, uh, writing for other platforms, you may need to download a, a FOST compiler, uh, then install it. Um, so it, it's just a little bit complicated. But if you are writing for web, just for web audio, this specific target, uh, thanks to mscripten and uh, LLVM, we have a, a web, web assembly version of our FOSS compiler that allows you to do everything on web just in the browser. So um, this is our workflow. If you have your, your FOSS source code, you will uh, have it compiled with our web assembly version of FOSS compiler. Uh, you will get the DSP function with its UI structure as you can define, can have description of UI, UI structure in the false code. Then with a node wrapper and a UI generator, you will get your audio worklet or script processor uh, false node with its HTML UI. Since 2015, this is all done, and uh, everything could be done just in web. So um, we have made a, a previous, previous version of Faust Online Editor, which allows you to, um, to write code in browser, to run it, and hear uh, how it sounds. You can uh, play it with a UI or MIDI devices. But when I am learning Faust, I'm like saying, uh, I need to know every detail about my DSP and my signal, and I need to know exact values of each samples. So um, I need to see, visualize my signal. This, this is why I developed this new version of Faust IDE. So uh, let's take a look. Um, I will show you the real version, which is um, already so online, this one. Yeah. Um, via HTTPS, you have faust.gram.fr slash IDE. So um, this is our default code if you can everything. Um, I'll just remove this free verb, and then in our code editor, you certainly have code highlighting, you have hinting, linting, you have um, documentations here. So um, our press process here is a um, post generator uh, that output and a one uh, each 10,000. Zoom, can I zoom? I will zoom a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, too much. <laughs> Like that? Maybe. Okay. Is it better? It's better. Uh, every 10 million, uh, yeah, uh, 10,000 
samples, it will output a one. It is connected to a physical model of string, of blocked string. So you have arguments like frequency, um, strike position, strike sharpness, gain, and the trigger that we omitted because we are connected, we are controlling it with our pulse generator. So let's run it. It works. Um, I will mute it for now for explaining what's on our layout. So um, we have a um, small file manager that you can do multiple fi files at once. And as for support file input, imports and exports, you can uh, have your library here and just do import uh, certain li libraries. Um, you have some, uh, you have one important button here, which is export, that allows you to, if you are not writing just for web audio, you can uh, export to multiple platforms. We have like VST, like Paddles, um, like iOS for, for phones, like everything. So um, you can adjust many options about uh, web audio node generations. You have a bunch of options uh, related to how you visualize your code. Um, I will show you later this. And on the right side, you have uh, all about audio, uh, all about inputs and outputs. You can choose your MIDI, physical MIDI input, or just using a, a computer keyboard to simulate it. You have audio file, which can uh, play as a loop. But it's not used here in our case of DSP. You have two small um, probes to probe your signal quickly, and you can um, like. Um, start record our signal output here at real time. And I click on save. Okay. So I have my signal now. I can drag and drop here to set it as a um, audio input. And to test it, I will uh, just exp uh, import a reverb here. Reverb. Okay. So let's listen to it. I have my signal with reverb. Okay. Now I want to visualize it so um, I can just pop up this. I can just pop up this UI to control it later. Uh, in my plot panel, now in offline mode, I can choose to continue more samples to visualize. Uh, we have mode uh, spectral scope to leave. And if I click on draw spectrogram, I can show you the spectrum here. Okay, um, so what I'm doing here is I want to connect it, my uh, free verb to our original DSP here. And uh, I will make a button a checkbox which named like Web audio conference. Uh, I will do multiplication, allow it to control my pulse. Uh, yeah. So, my foot, it works. Okay, I will just clear the thing. Yeah, because my, uh, uh, my reverb need two inputs, so. Uh, now it works. Oh. Okay. Now when I click on this checkbox, I will trigger on my DSP. So um, you will see here. So if you choose on event mode for plot, you will have uh, the data. When you trigger on the, the button, 
So um, you will just visualize uh, when you get this on. Okay. Um, so let's try some polyphonic things. Um, we have polyphonic instruments example from physical modeling. Uh, let's try a uh, guitar, guitar MIDI. Okay. I will stop my audio input and run. Okay. It's my guitar. And I need to play it with my computer keyboard. So uh, I need to switch my voices to eight in order to activate polyphonic mode. Um, maybe I can play it now. Uh, be careful. Okay, it works. So, um, um, yeah, now I have my DSP fully working, so um, maybe it's time to talk about web, web audio plugins. Okay, thank you. So this is my part. So let's start again the presentation. Uh, how do you put this in the full screen? Uh, okay, like that. Okay, so the web audio plugin is um, interesting because this is something we presented during the last work, and it was a way to make sort of VSTs uh, on the web reusable components that you can use in many hosts, like I saw on two different pictures there. So for details, go to the paper on the presentation from the last year. So a web audio plugin, what is it? It's a bit like VSTs, but they must be web aware. That means loaded dynamically into host applications. You don't have to compile them, you need just to expose them in a way, and we choose to, to use the main uh, key part of the web that are URL. So uh, uh, a plugin is a URL. You can see here three of our plugins in Amped Studio, uh, a DAO that, an online DAO, and uh, they didn't have to change any line of code to use them uh, in their host. So uh, in, in pictures, what is an audio plugin? It's uh, some DSP code, some user interface that must not conflict with uh, the rest of the application in the web page, no ID conflicts, no JavaScript variable conflicts or whatever. And then it's better if you add MIDI control so that you can use control panels to turn your knobs or whatever, or use an expression pedal or whatever. So the web, the web audio plugin format standard that we proposed is compatible with many, many languages and approaches. So you can develop in pure JavaScript, you can develop using some DSL, like first, like uh, um, compiled from C++. So we, we've been working a lot with people who made the web audio modules that are synthesizers compiled from, G, from C++ directly. So web audio plugins can be JavaScript, WebAssembly code, or web audio graph, or whatever. So we added uh, an advanced support in the first IDE for exporting directly. So what you see here on the right and on the top are uh, the plugins that I uh, made uh, using the first IDE without touching the generated code. I mean, uh, all using the mouse. And um, I will demo this uh, rapidly after that. So this thing, I made it yesterday with Norbert, I think. Uh, so this is the first IDE with a new tab here uh, and a UI builder. We were a bit fed up with Sodio. We wanted to be creative with graphics. This is your words, uh, Norbert, yesterday. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let me show you that. Uh, OK. So not this one. Uh, what's happening? Uh, yes, it's here. Okay, uh, it's strange that it's, uh, yeah, okay, I hope it works. So you, 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 you get some uh, DSP code somewhere, you pass it here, or you, you can use many of the examples from there, and when you compile them, for example, let's try this one, when you compile them, it generates a, a GUI that you can try. I Okay, so it works, and then if you press the GUI builder, okay, uh, it crashed, uh, I knew that it crashed, I don't know why. Uh, what's happening? Uh, uh, error somewhere, okay, let's try again. I hope, oh, okay, it's uh, Edurum or whatever, that does not work, what's happening here? Okay, so fortunately I have a video. <laughs> Somewhere, uh, yes. So uh, let me show that to you. 
uh, and I hope that um, uh, GUI Builder. So okay, so I made a video just in case of this uh, such a problem. So you just get some code, you try it. So you can uh, use the graphic editor for uh, customizing the the, um, the user interface. So you can change the, the type of switches, add texture, gradients, uh, um, change the, the police, uh, the knobs, and whatever. And in the end, when you publish, you press the publish button here. Okay, you're publishing to a local server, and you can try it directly. Uh, this is a, a web page, and you can try it like that. Okay. Oh, wait, I stop this. Okay, and once the the plugin has been uh, has been tried here, so you can publish it to. Um, okay, let me stop that. You can publish it to a remote server. Oh. Yes, you can publish it to a remote server. Uh, this is my, my slides, okay? Uh, so we didn't have a publication, an automatized publication system, so I used FileZI yesterday during the demos. And then it's available in many different host applications. So we developed for the, the, uh, the, the plugin developer some testers, so you can just copy and paste the URL here. And, uh, We've got also a sort of a guitar rig rack that scans different remote servers and displays all the plugins on the right with different categories. And by just clicking on them, you can assemble them and drag and drop them and um, delete some and choose an amplifier, guitar amplifier, for example. And um, we also uh, developed a, a sort of flagship application that is a guitarist pedal board that I showed yesterday. I thought I could make some demos, but unfortunately the time is running out and uh, <laughs> I got some problems, some network problems. So come to see us this afternoon. We'll have a demo of the Wasabi project and this is part of what we are presenting. And um, uh, so you can reuse it very easily. So I showed that already, but you can also use in any application. Yesterday I talked with uh, somebody who presented the DG app. So if you want to have pitch shifting, for example, just a few lines of code are required to load dynamically the plugin from this URL. And if you don't like the GUI, you can just remove the plugin.loadGUI line and the, just use, the, use it as a regular audio node, and you, you can have your own GUI interface and uh, set the params and so on. So it's very easy to reuse. So, uh, okay, I'm, I'm a bit sorry that I couldn't make the demo. I don't know why it crashed. I think it's a network problem. So the, what is interesting is that in uh, less than one minute, you can have a, a running plugin with a GUI. And uh, then you can spend more time with the GUI builder, or you can tweak the CSS and the, and the HTML or redo it yourself, but you've got a working thing. And it's very easy to reuse in any application. I mean, you won't have any conflicts in your own applications because we are using a web components that are completely isolated. So we are relying only on standard web components. No frameworks, no library, nothing. It's pure, uh, pure re Pure code. So, and also uh, with first, you can find thousands of examples on the web. Uh, yesterday, I showed how we recreated the electroharmonics uh, stun phaser. That is one of the best uh, phaser you can buy for if you are a guitarist. So, I, I started from a paper from DiFX, and then from the paper, yeah, I wanted to recreate this. So, I found a paper on the DiFX conference. I found the demo online. With. Okay, so then I found the GitHub repo of the guy. I copied and pasted this thing. <laughs> I, I, I pasted it in the, in the IDE. I don't know where it is. Yeah, I pasted it. Okay, it's crashed. Uh, on the IDE, and I generated the, the plugin that is uh, here. And I can show it to you. No, the no network apparently. I don't know. Well, maybe here. And it's all MIDI, uh, you can have MIDI learn and control it from a MIDI uh, platform. So uh, this thing, I think I made it in uh, one or two minutes yesterday, from the code to the, to the final uh, plugin. And let me try, maybe this thing will, is going to work. Yes, yes, this thing is working. So these are the plugins that we created yesterday. So this one is here. This is a host application. 
And uh, you can connect it. We can uh, add a guitar arm, and this will be my last word. Clean sound, activate the input and try. No. <laughs> Nothing wants to work today. I don't know why. Uh, okay, the input is not working. I guess, okay. Yeah, so you can try the plugins here. Um, and I finished now, a bit late. Okay, sorry for the, the problem, the demo effect we had. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Michelle and, and Xi Hong. Uh, we're really tight, so we, we may have time for like one quick question while use uh, prepares. Yes. Anyone yeah. has a question? <coughs> hey, thanks for this great presentation. This looks really nice. Um, as a part-time security researcher, I have to ask the question, how do you make sure that plugins from external sources adhere to security guidelines? Like, are they sandboxed? Do you, do you make sure they can't make external requests? Do they have access okay. to the local DOM and all these things? And okay. Uh well, what I presented is a way to produce plugins, but uh, on the other side, if you are a host uh, application developer and you, want, you don't want people to crash your host, uh, this is the case with uh, Ampet Studio. Uh, we've been working with them uh, a lot recently. So this is uh, uh, an online DAO, and here I'm just loading uh, some local plugins, okay? Uh, and the way uh, we are working with them is that first we are developing with the plugins on our own machines, trying everything so that it doesn't crash. Then we publish to the, their uh, testing server so they test it again. And then they make, it, they make them uh, public. Uh, the way it works with external plugins, they are using WebSockets in this, in this application. Not in our applications. We are connecting to, uh, uh, to our own, own graph. But in that case, they've got a special node, I think, that is just getting only the sound and the data. They're not uh, mixing the code with, our code, with their code. So uh, this is uh, what they choose for third-party applications, and it works with that latency. So this is uh, maybe one part. Uh, except of that, uh, with the first code, all the source is open source. With all the plugins we generate, we include the, the original source code. And uh, you can look at, look at it, so it's just pure web components. So we are not doing malicious stuff. But of course, if you don't take care of uh, when you're reusing your plug. But the problem m might arise also with compiling or with, with any, any other uh, uh, sort of uh, method for integrating other people's code. Any other question? You? No, about this DAWH tool, uh, yeah. is it free? Uh, is part of your, your no, work no. as well? No, no it's a, a commercial DAO made by um, uh, people from uh, Ampet Studio, and uh, one of them is Jari Clemola that, uh, is, uh, uh, hello, that came to, uh, yeah. regularly to the Web Audio Conference. It's been created by researchers at the beginning, and they found investors, and they decided to go on the Web Audio for commercial applications. So, um, uh, no, it's not free. Yeah, it's free for you, but it's not open source. Okay. And they've got a premium plan or something like that. But I don't know the details of uh, their business model. Mm -hmm. okay. no, I was asking yeah, but you can try it. What, what, what I just showed, you can try it, but without our arms, because it's still uh, um, in development. It's still a, a prototype. But it, but it works. Instead of that, what we are developing, and I can sh show you that, uh, is uh, that we are developing a rack uh, that is a, a sort of a guitar rig for... Um, this is a plugin, by the way, what you see the world, the world page, and uh, then you can assemble plugins like that. Uh, all these plugins have been made with the first IDE, uh, nearly without touching any line of code. Most of them, we didn't touch any line of code. And um, then you can try them. 
okay, let me just, okay, it's just for debugging this stuff. Uh, okay, this, this thing is not uh, public yet, but the, the other one, when, when I played guitar, it's public, all the testers are public. Uh, all the links are in the presentation, by the way. If you click on, the, on um, for example, if you click on that, you get the application here. And it's open. It's, uh, it's open source and it's uh, on the web, too, with all the plugins, including Norbert's plugin, we created yesterday. And the WAC plugins, for the moment, they are still online. We created this yesterday uh, during the presentation, the demonstration. Okay. I think right. We are already Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Let's thank you, Mr. And we now have a presentation by uh, Luis Jugla from uh, Sonos Suite and Music Technology Group in the University of Pompeo Fabra. And Alvin Correa, Paulo Alonso. And Chevy Serra and Dimitri Bagdanov. It's about a um, library called Sentinel. Uh, yeah, a C library for audio analysis that you can now compile on a browser. Whenever you're ready, Luis. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. <coughs> Okay, so thank you, Gerard, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here to present the work that I've been doing with my colleagues from Universidad Pompeu Fabra, Alvin, Pablo, Xavier, and Dimitri. Um, so the talk of today is um, what I'm going to present is how to have a Sentia in the browser. <clears throat> a little bit of background about who we are. So. I work as an um, audio engineer in Sonos Suite, and I'm also studying in the MTG. And together with the MTG and, the, and Sonos Suite, we've been working for the past half, year and a half in a collaboration project, developing, <coughs> sorry, developing algorithms to detect, detect audio quality problems in music. Because in Sonos Suite, we, we are a platform that uh, allows uh, digital music distribution, so companies that want to do musical distribution can uh, work with us, is a software as a service, white label. And so when an artist has to upload music, we have to make sure that the quality of that music is good to be able to send it to the channels like Spotify, iTunes, etc. Um, so we've been working on these algorithms that are now included in Essentia. So a little bit of summary. I'm going to explain what is Essentia for those of you who doesn't know. I'm going to show you some examples of what Essentia can do. I'm going to explain then how to have Essentia in the browser. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about further work that we want to work on. So Essentia is an open source library and a collection of tools for audio and music analysis, description, and synthesis. It's uh, written in C++. And it has bindings to be able to make it work in Python. In Python, it's just simple as install it with pip install Essentia, and you can start working with it. And it's released under a federal license, so it means that for any kind of research, you can use it for free. And if you want to use it uh, in a commercial product, uh, then you have to get a license. So a few things that you can do with Essentia. Essentia has inside more than 250 algorithms, and you can do things with it like key detection, organize a collection of sounds by similarity. You can do synthesis also. You can do melody extraction, do some segmentation. Mood detection is also inside the algorithms that you can use. You can do some spectral analysis or analyze the loudness of, of sound. Bit tracking, it has algorithms for audio fingerprinting. Also, onset detection, and you can also extract uh, features for any kind of uh, classification models. So those are like the main things that Essentia has. Well, the main things you can do with it. It has, more, like I was saying, more than 250 algorithms in it. Um, now I'm going to show you a couple of examples of what we're calling Essentia JS, which is Essentia in the browser. Um, here, for example, I'm going to show you 
This one, which is like, it's a code detector. Um, is this working? I'm sorry, I'm going to play it with a little piano in my phone, so it's not going to be super. But I'm going to play a C chord, and hopefully we will see now it's detecting a C. Well, it changed quite fast, but it did detect it. So now a D. Well, <laughs> you can see how it works. Um, so another example could be this um, loudness. So you can see, like, if I'm talking next to the microphone, it has these uh, values. And then if, I, if we get in silence, it goes down. It's working. <laughs> or, for example, some spectral analysis. Um, Here you can see like it's detecting and doing the spectrogram in male bands. Uh, for example, if I play a little bit the piano again. Well, hopefully you can see. Um, I'm going to show you now another example, uh, more related with what I was explaining about uh, our collaboration between Sonosuite and, and the MTG. So as I was saying, um, we need to detect audio problems. Here I have a, a song that has two gaps. The first one is, um, well, I, I created these gaps, both of them. The first one is what we call a, a, a problematic gap. It's just like an abrupt change of energy, so it stops completely, and then it starts again. And the second one has, um, it's what we could say, it's like an artistic decision. So it's a gap, but someone decided to do it and did it properly, doing some kind of fade in and fade out. So, um, if we call this algorithm called gaps detector, well, I mean, it's just, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. Better? Well, you can see, like, it, it did just, like, uh, that, well, run the algorithm to the song uh, and give, the, give us the the times where the gaps are starting and ending, so we can show it in the, in the player. So, for, like I was saying, for us, uh, quality control is very important, and right now, how we do it is with people listening to the track. So, with this, what we aim is to, to give the people listening to these tracks uh, a tool to, for them to have like, more information, so they can know where is a problem, so they can go to listen to that. I don't know if well, sound it's not working, but they can go here and listen and check if there is a problem really there or not. Um, okay. Back to the presentation. So, why is it in the browser? Well, mainly because we think all, all these features that I've been talking about are very interesting to have in the browser. So any JavaScript audio developer can play with them and do whatever. Um, so now I'm going to explain how to have a Sentia in the browser. Mainly, um, Sentia is a C++ code, like I was saying, so mainly we have to compile it with mscript then, and with this we will have a WebAssembly binary code and this JavaScript glue code that we can then import into the browser and work with it. So the uh, first step would be compile a Sentia with mscript then, uh, it took us a while to, to do it, but finally we managed to do it. So this is just uh, the few lines that you have to run to make it work. And don't worry about these lines. You have this GitHub uh, in the top right. So in there, you can see all the instructions, all the code that we've been working on, and you can go and play with it. So next step would be 
creating binding functions between C++ and JavaScript, uh, because you, you need to have this binding to be able to run any function from C++ into JavaScript. Uh, this is something that we, we have here, like a question mark, because we have a few bindings for a few algorithms that we wanted to work with. But as I was saying, Essentia has more than 250. And having to do all this code manually, it's something that we want to try to avoid. So we want to try to uh, automate this generation. Then once you have these bindings, you can just run this script that we have also in this GitHub. And to get, you compile together with uh, Sentia, and you have the WebAssembly file and the JavaScript blue code. Or you can also download this Docker image, skip step one, and go straight to step two, uh, running this Docker run command. Then once you have these files, you only have to import it into your web code. And it's also marked as a question mark because with plain JavaScript, it's as simple as that. But we work with Vue.js. And with Vue.js, another kind of webpack JavaScript-based things, uh, it's not as simple. We are still working on it. We have like a workaround, but we didn't find the proper way of doing it yet. Um, but well. And finally, once you have uh, your Sentia imported into the browser, you can just call it from this module variable that the glue code is generating. And it's quite simple. It's just these few lines. So finally, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about further work. As I was saying, the bindings, we want to to automate the code generation of these bindings, to not having to do it manually. Uh, we also would like, once we have all these bindings done, we would like to have a tool for the developers that want to use a center in the browser to choose the algorithms that they want to use. And so you, then you can, well, the system would build these uh, WebAssembly files with those algorithms instead of all the library. So you don't have to import in your browser all the library. There's also um, a conversion pr types problem. Well, it's not really a problem. It's just a thing that you have to do. Um, the conversion types between C and JavaScript are not exactly the same, so you have to do some conversions there. We have a few um, functions to do that, and we will. Well, some of them are released, and others will be, and in a something called like Essentia Utils.js. We also want to do some benchmarks and comparisons with other libraries in JS that do these kind of things like Meta. We are also still working on make it work with audio worklets. And once we have all these steps working, uh, we will finally write a paper. As I was saying, this is still work in progress, so you are welcome to collaborate. You're welcome to try it and give us feedback. Anything that you want to do, we're listening, and we will appreciate it. So, to the tak. Well, thank you very much, Luis. Um, uh, do we have any questions? Um, one there. Uh, Essential real, real seems to have professional tools. Uh, what I wonder about the loudness metering is can, can we select between different standards like K metering or EBU standards? Like loudness, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Essential, you have more than one algorithm for loudness. Okay. Yeah, okay. you only have to go to the Essential website and there you have all the information about all the algorithms and you can see we have for different standards. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? I saw you mentioned there that you do classification. Can you just quickly mention classifying what? 
a mo well, model? Well, I mean, in, we don't, like Essentia doesn't do classification by itself. It's, you have algorithms to extract features that then you can use to do your classification. Like you can train your models with these features that you can extract. Is that what you were asking? I'll, I'll just read the document, so thanks. Thank you. We can talk about it later, if not. Great. Does anyone has another question? Because I, I have kind of an insider comment question. So um, in order to use this, you have to um, develop your bindings in C++, right? Yeah. And I was wondering, because Sentia has these extractors, kind of example extractors. Yeah. Maybe you could provide some of those um, already ready-made to, to use in JavaScript. Mm, we haven't tried that yet. Okay. But in the end, it would be kind of the same idea. Like these structures are kind of like, kind of bindings to use Essentia for those things. So you can do kind of the same idea for JS, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, uh, let's thank the use again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we now have uh, another talk by uh, Christoph Guterin um, about polyfills for all your worklets. Um, so all the different polyfills we can use uh, in browsers that still don't support all your worklet situation that hopefully will will resolve soon. No, no, I don't have one. Uh, I want to compare apples with oranges, or uh, in our case, I want to compare audio works with polyfills. And uh, when that works, I can switch to the next slide. That's me. Uh, I'm Gustav Kutandin, and most of you know me already, probably. I have a little company called Media Codings, and I build multimedia applications for the web, which is why I'm so interested in the Web Audio API. And I'm usually named Chris Kutandin, so if you want to reach out to me, uh, you can ping me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle, or you can find me in our Slack channel, or almost anywhere else on the internet. And you probably all know that we have a lot of audio nodes that are provided by the Web Audio API, and they're uh, tiny little pieces which we can use to build our applications. And we have a lot of them, and we can do a lot of things with them, but there will always be that one audio node that you really wish to have, but it's not there. So. We need a mechanism to build custom audio nodes, and uh, up until recently, the script processor node was the thing we could use to do that. And up on the screen, you see a diagram that was my attempt to explain the script processor node. So you see two threads, like the audio thread and the main thread. And um, the script processor node works by, uh, by you specifying the buffer size at the beginning. You have to... Um, explicitly tell it what kind of buffer you need, if it's only 256 uh, samples, or it can be up to 60,384 samples. And depending on that, most browsers do double buffering, so they double the buffer on the audio thread, and then whenever they think it's, it's time for more data, they fire an asynchronous event on the main thread, uh, which is called the audio process event, and then you have to handle that event and have to fill the buffer. And the problem is, uh, the, the problems are the arrows, which I <laughs> inserted in the diagram, and they should symbolize asynchronous calls. So when the audio thread calls the main thread, it fires an event, and that event is a regular JavaScript DOM event. So it competes with all the other events from mouse interactions and uh, the user resizing the page and request animation frame and set timeout. And they all run in a queue, and they basically get executed one by one. And if you have a, a click event which takes 100 milliseconds, then you certainly have a problem because the audio process event can't be handled quick enough anymore. And then once that is done, the data has to go back to the audio thread again. So that's the reason why it's problematic, because we have this asynchronous calls in, in the rendering pipeline. And that's also the reason why it's deprecated. But we do have the audio workload now which also lives on both threads. It lives on the audio thread and on the main thread, but it doesn't have any asynchronous communication anymore. It still have, uh, has it, but not for the rendering. So the rendering is completely handled in the audio thread on the uh, right side. And it's uh, done by the audio workload processor, which is um, only concerned about rendering 128 samples 
each render quantum, so there will be no artificial delay because it's running uh, in the same um, loop as the, the audio uh, API itself. And if you want to communicate with it, you can either um, specify an audio param, like with every other audio node, or you can send uh, custom messages over the message port. And that happens asynchronously, but it's not a problem because it doesn't affect the rendering directly. And the audio workload is only available in Chrome so far. It's coming to Firefox as well, but uh, at least for the foreseeable future, there will be no audio workload in, in Safari. And so we have to do something like this. Uh, we have to check for the audio workload if it's available, if we want to use it, and then we use it. And if we can't use it, we have to come up with a fallback, which is most likely the script processor node for now. And this is unfortunate because in that case, we have to maintain two different um, parts of our code, which do actually the same, but are different. And that's usually where things get out of sync and uh, yeah, bugs get introduced very easily. So it would be much nicer if we have something magic that we can just import and then pretend the audio workload is there. So that's what the polyfill is made for. It's, it can, of course, not re-implement the audio workload because that has to be done by the browser vendor, but it can provide us with the same API by faking it under the hood. And that faking needs to be done with something we have already. And this is just a random list of APIs that the browser provides, so you don't have to read that. It's just, it's just to, uh, to uh, show you the principles of building a polyfill, that you, you just take whatever is there, and then you combine those. And they, these are, for example, the ones which people use to build polyfill the web audio API, you, uh, the audio workload. You just try to uh, find things which are already available and then build something which is not there with them. And the first polyfill that I'm aware of was built by Ari Klemola for the uh, Web Audio Modules project, which is the one Michel presented earlier. And he uh, achieved that by using a script processor node. And additionally, he used also a, a web worker, which is symbolized by the worker thread. And the web worker is doing all the processing. So the, the audio workload processor is running in the web worker. And that has a big advantage because it, it's nicely isolated. It has its own scope and its own runtime, its own uh, thread. So it's run, running in parallel. Um, but it also has a problem that we have two more asynchronous calls back and forth. So uh, in order to avoid that, I built another polyfill for my library, which is called Standardized Audio Context. That is a library which polyfills the whole Web Audio API, and so I had to have a polyfill for the workload as well. So my attempt um, looks like this. I removed the, the worker and instead evaluate everything on the main uh, thread, which can be risky if you run third-party code. If you have an audio workload which you just downloaded from somewhere, then this is probably not a good idea to evaluate it uh, alongside your other application code because as Charlie said yesterday, it's JavaScript and you can do almost everything with it. But <laughs> if, if you run your own audio workload, that's probably fine. But the main problem is that you need an almost idle main thread. So you have to make sure all the other um, things which you need, like the um, UI framework and stuff like that, is as minimal as possible to have time, enough time to run the audio rendering on the main thread. And shortly after I released mine, there was another um, polyfill released by Jason Miller. And he did that for the Chrome uh, Labs project. And he used an iframe to uh, render the uh, audio workload processor. And that looks very appealing because it, it looks like it's a different thread. But in reality, as I found out, that's not the case because if you have an iframe and uh, a main thread communicating with each other, that's synchronous. And once the one is doing work, the other one has to pause and the other way around. So uh, that's not much of an advantage. The only thing which, which, that's, uh, which this brings us is that we have um, a different scope. So we can easily break out of the iframe. So it's not a security feature. But it's, it prevents some bug that if you access something on the global scope accidentally, that will not work in the iframe. And while I was researching polyfills for the talk, I found another one, which I thought was very interesting. That's um, by Peter Salomonson, and it's for his JavaScript music project. And he doesn't use a script processor node at all. He just uh, has a loop, set timeout loop, and infinite set, set timeout loop as described in the famous article, The Tale of Two Clocks by Chris Wilson. And 
inside of that loop, he just renders um, the, the data, and then he schedules all the buffer source nodes. And that avoids the asynchronous calls, but it introduces the a delay because you have this look ahead when you have to fill the buffer, so it ends up being almost the same. So I tried to categorize all those polyfills, and the first attempt I made was um, running the web platform tests, which is a suite of tests that the browser vendors write themselves to uh, compare different um, API implementations. And there is, of course, also a test for the audio worklet. And it, it scores 100% uh, in Chrome, so all the tests pass. And it fails completely in Firefox, which is expected because the, they haven't enabled uh, the audio worklet implementation so far. But what already looks a bit suspicious is that they have almost 50% partially succeeding tests. And when I ran it with the polyfills, uh, the result was almost random. And um, as I found out, the tests rely on other APIs, which are not available in the browsers that I use. So the result is not very really, uh, valuable for us. The web platform test is actually a very good initiative, and I very much like it. But for, for that use case, it's, it's not usable. So I have a lot of tests as well for my standardized audio context um, because I'm very picky about the exceptions that it throws. It has to conform to the spec as much as possible. But that's also not really feasible to test the other versions with that because even Chrome uh, only has 70% of the things implemented, which I care about, which is just because me being so paranoid about all the exceptions it throws. So <laughs> I try to uh, group the polyfills by feature. So if you need, for example, the message channel to have asynchronous communication, you can use every one of them because that seems to be a critical thing and everyone has implemented it. But if you want to use audio params to communicate with the worklet, that seems to be only implemented in standardized audio context. And I'm not sure why that's the case. I think it's just because no one asked for that uh, <laughs> for the other implementations, but technically it should be possible to implement that. And if you need global variables, so on the audio worklet you have this current time and sample rate available. That's only available in the standardized audio context and in the Google Chrome Labs version. And another way to group uh, the polyfills is maybe to look by, uh, group them by use case. So if you have a real-time application which has, has to have very low latency, then there might be no other way uh, of doing it than running everything on the main thread with the Min at least minimal, uh, the minimal, most minimal uh, setup that you can think of, and which is actually the script processor node. And those two polyfills do only slightly wrap it, so that might be the best solution in that case. But as Paul uh, wrote in one of his latest blog articles, don't use the main thread if you don't have to. So um, yeah, well, but in that case, I think that's one of the cases where you have to. And. If you have still a real-time context, but the um, use is just more for playback, like if you're playing a song um, or something and it's not very interactive, um, you can use the web audio modules polyfill. Again, it introduces the additional delay because it uses the worker thread, but that also makes it more reliable because it doesn't depend so heavily on the main thread. And if you um, are keen to set the latency hint, you can probably also use standardized audio context because it will then uh, create a script processor node with a much larger buffer, which um, will allow you to have more uh, hiccups on the main thread without hearing it. And if you want to have an offline audio context, I would probably go for the JavaScript music uh, solution, uh, which is just scheduling whenever you have time. And that's also implemented in standardized audio context, so I have that implementation for the offline audio context. So that might be, uh, it, it's my recommendation for the offline use. And another thing which you might uh, want to consider if you uh, run third party code, so if you have uh, something like a door and you allow people to upload their uh, audio worklets, then the only option you have is actually the web audio modules polyfill because that isolates the code. In, in the best way possible, and if you don't do it, then yeah, people might break your applications with their uh, workload. And if you build uh, something which other people should use, then you should, uh, it's the opposite use case, then you should avoid um, writing something to the global scope or modifying the global scope. And the only two uh, polyfills that don't do it is uh, the web audio modules one and standardized audio context. So depending on your use case, you can probably 
uh, rule out some of them, and then you end up with one that, that fits best for, for your use case. And after talking 20 minutes about performance, I want at least want to mention that, that um, as long as you don't have a problem, you basically don't have a problem and don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if you could start setting up. Is there any question? Hi, Christoph. Uh, thank you for your presentation. That's really uh, instructive. Uh, we kind of face all these problems that you mentioned in our implementation of the audio worklet for SAMA. Um, something that we still haven't tried is when we want to implement uh, variable uh, audio buffer size on the audio worklet, which I think it entails implementing a, a double ring buffer. Oh, yeah. Have you ever tested any solution that that does so, and what were your results? I heard rumors that Paul wants to present something in his workshop tomorrow, so maybe I shouldn't say anything, because he knows it much better than I do. So. Okay. Do you have another question? Thanks. Um, it's super interesting to see all these options side by side. I, I was just curious with standardized audio context, is it easy to just pull the audio worklet out? No, uh, that, that's a big trade-off. It's, it's a, a package which you can only use at once, and you can't get pieces out of it. It's, you either have to use it completely or, or not at all, so that's the trade-off. Yeah. Any other question? Right, so in this case, I think we can thank Christoph again. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll finish the session with a triple presentation by um, Francisco and uh, Chris and Tor from the University of Sussex, who will present a revolutionary new audio worklet based signal engine for live coding language ecosystem. Um, they, I think you had the chance to see them yesterday play and they also have a, a workshop this Friday, uh, which I presume is very well connected to this presentation today, uh, allowing you to create your own uh, programming languages based on, on this, um, this web audio engine. Um, I think we need a couple, maybe one minute to set up. All right, hello everyone. Um, we're presenting the SAMA system uh, and a paper called an audio worklet based signal engine for a live coding language ecosystem. And you might have seen that ecosystem, um, the kind of bleeding edge of it yesterday in, in our performance. But um, we are the Sussex team, Francisco, Chris and me, Thor, uh, that are working on a project called MIMIC, Musical Intelligent Machines Interacting Creatively. And it's a project with goldsmiths who are uh, working on the machine learning aspect and uh, the website and the MOOC. Uh, Durham, that is uh, working on um, machine listening. And at Sussex, we are building a live coding language to, intra to combine machine listening and machine learning. Um, and we are providing um, um, a live coding interface to these um, technologies. So, but the, the whole idea of the project is to bring uh, machine learning and machine listening to the creative coder, the, the kind of regular creative 
a person who uses JavaScript or other high-level high languages to do their art. And we have this Mimic website where we have all kinds of projects um, we, where we can build interfaces or demo how to build interfaces for machine learning. But we thought that um, when we, when we uh, designed the project, we think actually that live coding is an interface. Live coding languages can be an interface to, to the machine, uh, to machine learning, to machine listening. So a little introduction to live coding for those of you that might not know it so well. You saw, of course, quite a lot of it yesterday. But it's a, it is a new musical practice. It is kind of composing the piece and playing it at the same time. It is you're writing score and your computer is the interpreter of the score and you're playing. The coding language is the, the instrument, so to say. So it's a creative activity. Um, it's something that you can do at home to relax, sit in the sofa, live code, make some music. Um, I, but it's also this act of writing publicly to share the code, to project it up, and, and to kind of communicate, democratize the process of, 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 um, of making music. So in that sense, it's a public reasoning. You know, you're, you're sharing your thoughts, your, your tests and trials and your mistakes as well, you know. Um, so it offers freedom, ownership and control. It is real practice. Uh, it is um, not fake, like Norbert said about some music, you know. It is, <laughs> it is difficult practice, you know. There is nothing fake about live coding. Um, so we before we started to create the live coding language for SEMA, we were thinking, what kind of language will that be? And we asked people around, what, what kind of language do you need for machine learning and machine listening? And we made a survey, and people were talking, you know, some people wanted object-oriented, functional programming, all kinds of paradigms. They wanted it to be flexible, expressive, extendable, and uh, good for prototyping. Uh, documentation, examples, community, all these kind of typical things that, that make a language good. Um, or in short, brevity, simplicity, expressivity, flexibility, adaptability and plurality. So, for us, we started thinking, what kind of language is that? You know, how are we going to make everything possible? Um, and to kind of echo Norbert's question again yesterday, why do we need another live coding language? And there is, a, there is actually, I think we need hundreds of new live coding languages. Because a live coding language is a high level system. It's a conception of how to do a certain thing, a domain specific, but it's a mini language. And, um, when you make music, you want to make something unique. You want to be different. You want to try open up new dimensions of thinking. And that's where a new live coding language comes in. Because as Charlie pointed out yesterday, if everyone is using Tidal, everyone's music sounds like Tidal or Sonic Pi or Jibber or Ixilang or whatever, you know. Uh, so, so why not create a system where every language is designed by the user? So that's what we're trying to do. We came up with a system where people make their own live coding language, where their own kind of musical interests can be encapsulated in a small language um, that is maybe just a musical piece or a little instrument. It's not a kind of uh, a solution to all your musical problems, but it could be a solution to one problem. And that's, that's where we think it's important to create um, a framework for smaller languages. Okay, I have this. Oh, Thanks. Yeah. So, enter SEMA, a live coding language design playground. So, it's a meta approach to live coding language. So, some of the design principles that you came up at the start of this design exploration was to have an integrated signal engine, which the meta language and the signal in, and the, the, the code that goes into the signal engine is integrated. We have simple sample signal processing to support uh, physical modeling, filter design, uh, simple rate sample rate 
transduction, which means that everything is translated to audio rate, like even if we intend to use sensor data in the future, everything is transduced to sample rate. We have pretty mostly uh, no abstractions in the meta uh, language, so the abstractions should be created by the user at user design level. And we're striving for, of course, uh, what's the best trade-off of simplicity and flexibility, prior prioritizing the usability of the language design process for the user, the learnability to, to uh, foster a smooth learning curve, and trying to, tra to balance all these trade-offs with uh, an efficient implementation of an audio engine. So, now, uh, going a little bit back to how this fits in the, whole, in the overall uh, MIMIC uh, goals, which is to integrate machine learning, machine listening, and audio. Some of the machine learning processes that we, are, that we intend to use are um, real-time, on-the-fly machine learning workflows in which users train their own models locally, f rapidly, and that they control the whole process. So there's this kind of a um, feedback loop in which the user, a machine learning non-expert, actually provides data uh, and the machine learning design parameters such as algorithm selection, hyperparameter selection, thresholds, providing guidance, and receives the predictions, classifications, clusters, and it steers the process as it goes along. So this was one of the first things that uh, uh, exposed a specific limitation or a constraint that we had to solve. And this paper is all about that, how this design constraint kind of uh, guided our implementation. So I'm going to do a short demo that's going to highlight some of the problems that uh, Christoph just talked about, about single-threaded applications, the script processor node. So it's a, a, an integrated, real-time, interactive uh, machine learning workflow for audio. Uh, right. So, OK. So here, it's a very simple application, like it's a like the minimal, <laughs> the fundamental example of using a neural network to modulate uh, pulse width modulation synthesis. And what I'm going to do is to use the mouse position to control a set of four parameters of a simple synthesizer. And I'm going to... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Live coding. Uh, why? So can I do it? Okay. So you can see that... Right. So what I'm going to do is to uh, assign, test a machine learning, a very simple uh, machine, neural network to map between two sets of parameters. And this is like the bare bone, ex bare bone example of an interactive machine learning flow. So right now, I'm training that area of the screen with a set of parameters. And now I'm going just to change a little bit. I'm going to train the other area. So I'm, I'm creating a data set in real time with uh, mouse positions, a stream of mouse positions. Now I'm going to train the model. And now it's running. So did you happen to listen to something strange in the middle? So if I... If I train another area, so this is the third state. If I train, 
help was that? So it's running, and you see that it's modulating in real time according to the... So, what is, what, what is the problem here? So the problem is that we're looking at a computational intensive process, which is the machine learning module, uh, model training, that's thread hogging the main JavaScript thread. And it just freezes. And the audio engine, this is an audio engine that's built on the script processor node, also got frozen. So we have like an audio freeze. So this shows like one of the limitations of using the script processor node. Um, um, you are also, uh, there are also other problems like clicks and audio dropouts in the machine learning inference phase, which is when it's running. And then, so this is, so basically, this was the motivation for us to design a loosely coupled audio architecture with dedicated threads and using audio worklet to have like a dedicated audio thread. Um, so Chris Stuff already mentioned what are all the problems that, and the benefits of adopting that new approach. So basically we had to refactor a library, a DSP library that, that we have, and it was mostly building to ASMJS and using script processor node. And the whole paper basically describes what's the rationale to build the audio engine in our solution, SEMA. So this is the overall architecture, and in red you see that there's the audio engine with an audio worklet implementation, and we came up with a design, well, we think it's a design pattern because we're evaluating code dynamically in the render call of the audio thread. So basically, we're, we have this whole workflow in which we compile the user languages and generate DSP code on the fly that gets injected and dynamically evaluated in the render thread, in the audio worklet. Uh, so this is the user workflow in SEMA. So basically you have to express a grammar to create a new language. It's, that's done in EBNF, which is Bacchus in our form, uh, form, syntax notation. You have your language design. And so we have like this online real-time compiler that just generates a parser, generates an abstract syntax tree, which then translates into DSP code, which then gets injected in the audio engine. So basically, SEMA, it's an online reactive compiler. Um, this is an example of one of the languages that we used yesterday. So this is the default language, and this is the end result after the compilation process. This is the DSP code in the Maximilian li library that gets injected into the audio worklet rendering thread. So we've got a couple of minutes. We'll just do a really quick demo of the system. So it's running here. Uh, so it runs in Chrome, and what we have is a live coding window, and at the moment you've got a grammar window, so you can kind of live edit your language as well. It, the system comes with a default language, which is a, a pretty simple DSL. We can just have a look. Uh, so, for example, you can probably tell what that's going to do. It's going to make a saw wave. It hasn't got anything extravagant like classes or loops, but it, it's got variables, so we could put that in a variable, for example. Uh, we can make a couple of those. And uh, mix them together, maybe. So, as a simple example, if you want to edit your language, you've got your language definition here. If, for example, we wanted to make a kind of special DSL for WAC, we felt, felt like we want to have a WAC-themed language, we could, uh, <laughs> we could specifically demand that all our variables started with WAC. So now I'm, uh, I've changed that language. Now this doesn't compile anymore because none of them start with WAC. But if I could laboriously change them all, and then it might work again. So here's my special WAC-themed language just for today. Um, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> well, there's some evaluation stuff that we could just uh, have a quick look at. How do we full screen this? So we did some load testing. We made a special load testing language 
which is just basically trees of sine oscillators, and you could uh, just make these at random depths and fling them at the audio engine. So we wanted to just check that it's feasible to use uh, this for live coding. In terms of load testing, we did this test where you'd get a latency in the... If you injected a, a kind of a lot of sine oscillators, you get a, a latency that followed in the evaluation after you'd just done that code injection. So we can see we can kind of get up to kind of 250 sine oscillators, and then we get this big latency spike in the green here. So it's not going to be great for additive synthesis, but for a kind of typical live coding use case, that's going to be fine. Uh, latency testing, so the time from when you evaluate, execute your code to the time you're going to hear something, we can divide that up into three areas. Uh, firstly, the pass time, so uh, the time it takes to turn your code into an abstract, abstract syntax tree, and then the time that that tree gets takes to turn into code, and then the eval time. So we send that code down to the audio worklet, and it calls eval in JavaScript. So these are the these combined times, and we can see that as the load gets heavier, up to kind of a couple of hundred oscillators, it's still all happening roughly under 20 milliseconds, so not really perceptible by the live coder. Um, yep, I think that's it. So that's the com combined latency testing times, and that's it. Right, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. Uh, I think we're almost uh, at the limit, but we probably want to do, make some questions. Does anyone have a question? I have one over here. Mm -hmm. I don't see any microphone. Oh, right. Thank you very much for creating this great system. And I'm very flattered by the choice of the name for it. What does it stand for? Uh, so we took inspiration from a, an American philosopher that writes about semantics and the limits of the language. But eventually, last week, we found that Sama in Turkish means the universe. So, I think the universe is kind of <laughs> looking towards us, towards Sema. Thank you. Uh, I know in Turkish, uh, Sema is a female name, and uh, I always have problems with that. <laughs> Sema is the, the Greek, ancient Greek for a sign, for a symbol. Any other questions? Uh, what over there? Hey, um, uh, so uh, I might have missed something, but um, I'm just wondering, like, how easy is it to like uh, use Lexus of uh, different programming languages and uh, build a, build a SEMA language out of it? We have our own, so we have one integrated uh, Lexer, uh, which is called Moo, and that's what's used uh, to um, actually. I can actually show. So when you, you're expressing the grammar, you have different sections. So for instance, here, can we? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, quick demo. Yeah. So in the white background zone, this is where we express. This is where ex we express the grammar. And you see that we, we have this zone, which is your lexer. That's where you define your lexemes or tokens for the language. And here, it's where you define your grammar production rules and semantic, semantic actions which build the code. So we are using a library called Moo that just compiles your lexer that gen then gets passed to your, for the parser generation and uses nearly for the generation, for the parser compilation. Any other question? 
I have a question for you. Um, how would you define the sonic limitations of the system? So you use, do you use like the web audio oscillators or Maximilian unit generators or something like that? What's the palette of sounds that you can use? Uh, so we use everything that's in Maximilian library. Uh, so the, the palette of sounds is a uh, pretty broad, broad, really. There's a lot of, a lot of different modes of synthesis in that library. And it, it's kind of growing as, as we pull things into it, as we need as well. So it's uh, yeah, quite transient, I guess. Right. Uh, should we finish here before? Oh. Uh, yeah. So if we go to uh, the GitHub repo, there's a link. And there's a, an online version that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, uh, but that's just a simple problem that we hope to sort out for uh, Friday's workshop. Because uh, this is a multi uh, JavaScript worker implementation, so everything is split, and we don't have workers cached. It's just a simple problem. We'll sort that out. But uh, yeah, you'll be able to try tomorrow. Right, um, so that concludes the session. Now let's thank the speakers again. And I think we have some special announcement now. Uh, I will just invite you again for joining the jam session tomorrow in the evening. So there's a form to fill in. If you don't find the form on Slack channel or something, just contact me and I can send you by email. I can send you by email, okay? And see you tomorrow. And we'll be here again 11.15. So you don't get late for the lunch. Thank you. The the roof. Oh uh, yeah, the group photo. You have to take. The, we have to take a picture. Okay, so. The jam session will be on Friday, so anyone can join. It's on Slack channel.
Cornelia Metzig, who's from the Queen Mary University of London, who's going to talk about enhancing social interactions in music streaming. So thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Um, I present this um, work that I, is mainly the work of my colleague Alo Alik and Florian Thalmann, and I have done a part of it as well. And we are exploring the question how we can enhance so social interactions in music streaming. Um, so the questions we are interested in and we want to explore is how do people explore and select music? What kind of interfaces are they presented? How these interfaces affect the way they, what their selection? Um, and how we can make music discovery more collaborative and enrich the sharing experience? Um, so m mostly the, the, the standard methods are um, that the interfaces have like playlists um, and the, the tracks have metadata, like is structured in metadata, albums and artists and so on, and also some higher level data like popularity, genre or mood. And we are looking more at alternatives such as networks of songs, um, clusters and scatter plots, and then um, those can be done with different ways of um, computing, different similarity measures depending what you're interested in. Um, in, this, in this presentation, I focus on mood play. It is um, a, a data set um, where the tracks, um, they are scattered on a plane just like this. Each dot is a track, and they have two-dimensional mood coordinates, valence and arousal. So from the left to the right, it's from, it, the valence is um, from negative to positive, and from um, bo um, bottom to top, it's the ar arousal, which is from calm to excited. And they have mood, these, these um, mood variables, they come from the website Last.fm from human annotations, and then there's a method to compute those two-dimensional mood tags from them, and it has 10,000 tracks. Um, these moods, they can be grouped into regions. Here you see like the, the, the names are scary, angry, and then party, upbeat, uh, mellow, slow, depending um, on these two coordinates. And that is um, the underlying how, how you can um, select music on this, on this mood play. Here's how, how it looks like. The, the user has this interface that is this plane. And we have these mood tags and the data, and the, the streaming comes from the service Deezer. Um, so we, we, I present here three different methods that we explore in this work. One is the social interaction to vote for music, where each user selects a preferred location in this mood space. And then the user preferences are displayed by their names on this plane. And you can vote, and your vote counts for a certain time and before it disappears. And you can only vote once and until, until, until you, um, this has disappeared. And so um, the, on the plane, there is an average mood that changes depending on who is voting. And there is a cursor, and that cursor will um, then play the music. That's how it looks like. Some of you have seen this. I, I, there was a demo about the same yesterday, and some have played around with it. So this, this cursor is moving around in a direction where the average mood is. And then um, the songs are played that are, the tracks are played that are um, behind there. Um, yeah, then the second option. So the, the, we have also in implemented that if um, not enough people are using it at the moment, some bots appear that vote also so that it keeps playing even if you stop voting. But as soon as someone votes, it, there's no artificial bots voting. It's only the humans. Um, another option is to have a private party. Um, and the, the goal is that you don't want to be sharing music with people you don't even know and you might not have the same taste. And then you can make your own party and invite people that you want to share music with. And then the, the system works again the same, that you vote and like on, like on this plane, except that um, you control who is on this, on this, um, uh, in this party. And then the third option is that people can upload themselves 
um, tracks and they get added to their own private party. But the only caveat is that you don't have the mood tags for any given song. And so here I present this algorithm, um, how to calculate where a, a song would sit if, if you want to attribute a mood to it. Um, so of course, you, one option would be just to do it manually, like decide yourself what you think. But what we did here is they are added to, um, we, we extract features from the whole data set and um, calculate so high and low level, level features with the WAMP plugins. They look like, here's two examples, um, all, all sorts. Um, and then from those, I calculate some summary statistics, such as like the moments, autocorrelation, but also entropy, and then also at different um, levels of resolution, such that you can map each song into a vector. And then in on this plane, I, I trained a random forest classifier to identify um, in the first place how well it is possible to, to predict the mood depending on, from those extracted features and statistics. And in the second place, because this gives me uh, um, insight which are the informative features. And then I can use those to calculate um, the mood for, for songs that I don't know it yet. So I, I trained a classifier and the, um, on the four like corners, and um, it's it's relatively well possible. And then here are the importances for the prediction of arousal. So the mo the gray is always the random forest importance, and then in fr in the front you see two colored um, bars that are the two means of 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 the two groups, how well they separate. And so and then in diagonal that's the title of the plugin and of the statistics that are informative. So the most important to predict arousal is the, the average onset rate, which is not really a surprise. And then I did the same with a, another feature selection for the second variable for the valence. And there the most important is the, the skewness of the spectral flux. So how fast the power spectrum changes and the skewness thereof. And so these are the importances. Uh, and, and you see like how um, it would go on like I'm, I'm extracting a hundred. I'm calculating this for a hundred features out of 400 that I use in total. And then you have those informative features, and with them you calculate the mood tag for new songs in the way that um, you use only the most informative ones to have le less noise because otherwise it's just too too much data. Um, separate for violence and arousal, and um, in that space, I calculated a co an Euclidean distance of a given track I want to upload to all others. And then I, um, I pick the nearest neighbors with it Euclidean distance and use the, the average mood of the nearest neighbors in terms of violence and arousal. And that's the mood I attribute to a song. So in that way, you can include new, new um, songs. Um, and then another and another feature that this this um, website has it it mixes the songs automatically into one another. So when you when when this cursor is moving around on the mood play um, plane, um, there is an algorithm that mixes them automatically into each other. So I am not I have not done this part, so I can't um, um, explain it in detail. So there is like an auto DJ node module, and it finds the most appropriate transition between two tracks. And it does this by using a decision tree based on audio descriptors like tempo, key, regularity, dynamicity, and then the ratio between of, of that between the tracks. And it infers this um, from feature data extracted in the browser using piper.gs. So that's how it looks like. You have the S1 and S2, like the, the yellowish and the, the um, green. And they have all these features, and then you make Depending on them, you you tr create a transition, the, the M, um, recombining elements of the two tracks, and um, this and then constraints define the crossroads or effects. So this is how such a e decision tree looks like. You have you first ask, do they have regular beats, yes or no, and then further question, tempo ratio close to one or cl tempo ratio close to an integer, and 
um, or harmonically similar, and then you come up with different ways of mixing them into one another. And who has been at the yesterday at the demo might have seen um, this. Okay, so here are the um, the, the mood plays open source. Here are some some links if anyone wants to play around. The first is like the website where you that I showed yesterday, and um, for the auto DJ there is also this website. Um, yeah, so that was what I wanted to present. Um, if you have questions, Alo and Florian did a big part of it. You can also um, contact them. They unfortunately couldn't make it here. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'd just like to apologize. I messed up on the timing of that. So sorry, sorry that it was my fault. I messed up on the timing of that. So oh. you have plenty of time. Um, so are there any questions? We've got loads of time for questions. Okay, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so the choice of music, um, people use music to either uh, reflect or change their mood. Do, do you kind of find that, so p for example, if you're looking for sad music, it might be um, because you're feeling that way, or it might be that you want music to change how you're feeling. Um, how does that get reflected in, in this? I mean, it doesn't really address this in, in particular. It's, it's just... Um I think here you, the way it's presented here, it's like it uses the mood as a proxy for your taste somehow. And you can choose, depending on your mood, you can choose what kind of music you want to listen to, but we haven't explored the interaction with the user or if, what effect it has on the user. But it could probably be done with this website somehow. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Ah, yes. uh, what music library are you using? Um, so the, these mood play tags, we have the, the mood variables for 10,000 um, tracks, and um, they get played from the previews from Deezer, and they only play always 15 seconds, and then mix them into one another. Okay. Any, Any other questions? Question? You've been let off lightly then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cornelia. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, we'll just give Scott a moment to get set up, and I'll try and get the timing right for you this time. Uh, so this is Scott Stickland from the University of Newcastle in Australia, um, who's going to be talking about the design of a real-time multi-party collaboration application. So just give him a second. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you for having me. Uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter because I'm not actually going to be talking about any web audio APIs. In fact, I'll be talking specifically about my use of web MIDI and web RTC. APIs, so I hope you can uh, bear with me. Uh, just a couple of disclaimers, I'm not endorsed by any door company whatsoever. Um, and second of all, whenever I refer to real time, I'm meaning as close to real time as possible. So, the project that I'm doing is part of my uh, PhD. Um, it began by examining and highlighting the strengths of existing door platforms with collaborative functionality and classifying them in terms of synchronicity, multi-party capability, audio fidelity and their communication methods. So beginning with Cubase 7 unveiled in 2013, Steinberg introduced the VST Connect Pro VST Connect Performer solution, offers synchronous one-to-one -one collaboration by streaming processed audio using Vorbis compressed frames in Steinberg's proprietary streaming format, uh, recording a remote performer's multi-channel streamed audio in real time in addition to MIDI streaming and real-time communication via audio-visual channels. 
Source Elements is Source Connect Pro, integrates audio streaming with most of the major door platforms by operating as a plug-in and implementing rewire synchronization and audio data transfer. With an absolute maximum of four concurrent connections, Source Connect Pro implements the enhanced low delay AAC version two lossy audio codec for, as they claim, effective high quality streaming. Cubase and Pro Tools offer very similar asynchronous methods of collaborating by uploading projects, audio files and settings to cloud storage through their respective platforms, VST Transit and cloud collaboration. Invited parties can download the project and its files, effectively synchronising their local project with the cloud version independently work on the project in their own studio, then upload their contributions to the cloud. Web browser-based doors, which are inherently collaborative in nature, also provide asynchronous collaboration. Soundtrap, for example, presented at this conference in 2017, employs similar methods to Cubase and Pro Tools, but uniquely blends real-time video conferencing and text-based messaging with the ability to contribute to and synchronize with a cloud version of the DOOR project. Other browser-based DOORs, such as AMP Studio 2 and BandLab, share their projects by co-opting social media platforms and allowing for the creation of multiple versions or forks of the project to create an accessible history of the project's development. However, at present there is no existing method for synchronous multi-party collaboration on a shared door project over the internet, providing each party with equal simultaneous access to the door project while also working with high fidelity audio assets. So, our work began with the premise that whatever the final form of the collaboration model, rather than stream data intensive high fidelity audio to all collaborators, instead, we would endeavor to stream control data generated by operating the door locally. This led us to ask three questions. So the three questions, can we get the execution of door commands to trigger low volume IP compatible control data? The second question, can all of the collaborations door instantiations receive the streamed control data, triggering a uniform execution of the same commands? And thirdly, can all of the collaborators communicate effectively in real time as operation and editing takes place? So we consequently landed on the idea of creating and designing a web browser based application that will interface directly with existing mainstream door platforms. The interface application needs to fulfill certain roles, particularly providing a way to minimize the effect of latency and jitter inherent in streaming data over the internet. Equal access to and synchronous operation of a door platform. High fidelity audio assets, at least 44.1 kilohertz as a sample rate and a 16 bit bit depth. And a video conferencing style of real time communication. And by grounding the interface application in the browser, we could then utilize the web MIDI and the web RTC APIs to facilitate these roles. In choosing which mainstream door to use, uh, for our proof of concept, we utilized Cubase Pro for its generic remote feature that allows users to define specific MIDI messages, including type and channel, controller or note number and maximum value, and then map them to specific door functions or operations. This map takes a form of an XML file and the door can be triggered by these messages to carry out the mapped function or transmit these messages when a user performs a function manually. 
This is a model of the DCIA, the Door Collaboration Interface Application model, and it's five different data streams. The first is session description protocol messaging, identification and negotiation of ICE candidate connections and NAT traversal. Second is collective audio and video media streams generated from each party's webcam and microphone sources. Cubase Pro generated MIDI control data produced by a local instantiation and then sent to all other parties in real time. Similarly, MIDI control data received from the remote instantiations of Cubase Pro and directed to the local instantiation. And finally, the Cubase Pro, fi uh, Pro, Cubase Pro project file and associated audio stems uploaded to and downloaded from cloud storage. We made the decision for the DCIA to stream control data rather than streaming audio generated by each Cubase Pro instantiation for the following reasons. The volume of stream control data is significantly less than, uh, than streaming audio generated by the Cubase Pro. This results in reduced latency and demands on the available bandwidth. Therefore, there's no requirement to utilise lossy audio codecs, and of course, then there's no inherent jitter of any received audio. To efficiently distribute a Cubase Pro project and its audio files, the interface application utilises cloud storage and file sharing. So, the DCIA will therefore facilitate editing and processing of the project's audio files across all of the Cubase Pro instantiations in the collaboration. To achieve synchronous operation across all of the door instantiations, we align playback and navigation around the Cubase Pro project. Since we're utilising web MIDI ports, MIDI timecode and MIDI machine control system exclusive messages are additionally streamed to all participants. Uh, one Cubase Pro instantiation becomes the generator of timecode and machine control, while all other Cubase Pro instantiations in the group enable external synchronisation via timecode and the reception of MIDI machine control messages. The key feature of the DCIA is the ability to receive local control data in the form of MIDI messages via web MIDI ports, direct the control data to web RTC data channels and link the channels to all other remote participants. Since web RTC data channels are bilateral, the DCIA also receives local control data from remotely uh, remote uh, door instantiations on the same channel and directs it to the local Cubase Pro instantiation. For the proof of concept, we wanted to test the multi-party connection capabilities of the DCIA and to do so we implemented a basic mesh architecture establishing multiple peer-to-peer -peer connections. The DCIA prototype is split into two basic sessions, sections, the video conferencing section and obviously the MIDI input and output port selection section. Selecting the two MIDI ports will automatically open each port and assign them as the ports either carrying MIDI control data from or to the local instantiation of Cubase Pro. It is important in selecting each port that they correspond with the matching input and output ports designated in Cubase's generic remote, MIDI time code and MIDI machine control setup windows. The testing showed that we could indeed create multiple online connections to Cubase Pro instantiations via the DCIA and send synchronous MIDI control data, MIDI time code and MIDI machine control messages whilst maintaining a video conferencing style of communication. We determined that a mesh architecture established steady connections for up to six simultaneous participants 
after which the demands of the test machine CPU became noticeable and adversely affected the stability of each connection. This included frozen video streams and increasingly distracting audio stream jitter and a progressive lack of door responsiveness and extended delays in executing data heavy functions such as level fader operations. So there are three further developmental phases planned for the project. We are currently testing multi-party connection architectures via different media server configurations, specifically MCUs for media and data streams, SFUs for media and data streams, and uniquely a hybrid uh, uh, MCU for the media streams and SFU for the data streams. We're conducting that work in conjunction with Frozen Mountain, they're a Canadian-based uh, media server supplier, and we're using their live switch WebRTC server. Uniquely with Frozen Mountain, they allow WebRTC data channels to be routed through their media server along with the media streams. I'll then be interviewing Australian recording studio engineers, both owner-operators and some of the major studio complexes to gather their impressions and use of and requirements for online collaboration in their work routine and their door preference. And then finally, further development of the DCIA in light of the interview feedback and testing the version of the DCIA with the same studio engineers. Uh, so that's it. Any questions? Thanks very much, Scott. So have we got any questions? Yeah. Hi, Scott. I'm Hi. Rebecca from Source Elements. I built Source Connect. Right. Um, nice to meet you. Um, and you. Just wondering if you're familiar with our restore and replace feature. Yes. I yes. didn't mention that. I thought maybe you would. Oh, no, no, definitely aware of it. Uh, I actually uh, mentioned that in the paper ah. rather than in the presentation. Right. Yes. So, uh, yes, that's sort of the asynchronous uh, streaming of high fidelity audio post collaboration. Yeah, it means that you can send a low quality stream when you're you know, sensitive to bandwidth. And then um, at the other end, you know that you're going to get a full PCM recording as if you had flown to the remote location and recorded it yourself yes. there. So we feel that that's a really important part of um, working on the internet in real time, sorry, interactively. Um, <clears throat> I'm just making a decision not to use the word real time ever again when it comes to the internet. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I think that's an important part of considering um, building a door online. And I look forward to seeing your research. It's great to see. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Any more questions? Oh, there's one at the back there. Oh, can you just pass the microphone? Hi, uh, I'm from Soundtrap, actually. Um, two questions. Um, one is, uh, did you do the testing using a local network or like over the internet as well? Uh, uh, Testing both on a LAN and then over the internet, both. Yeah, and, and like, I guess, did you n notice any like big differences between these two situations? Uh, yes, particularly because I was uh, testing uh, the same machines in the same studio space, uh, the latency factor between uh, sending the control data and then having it being received at the other end, that is definitely noticeable. I think because we're using localised playback, not streamed audio playback, the, uh, the issue of latency doesn't really become a problem, um, simply because every collaborator is listening to their own door playback, not some collaborative audio playback. Yeah, thanks. And another question. Uh, so is the MIDI time clock uh, stream, is that like reliable enough to, to sync everyone? It has been so far, yeah. Okay, that's um, once again, uh, just using the mesh architecture, uh, yes, past six, uh, it really started getting very dodgy. Um, however, sorry, dodgy is um, 
you know, it was glitchy. Um, uh, however, uh, yeah, we're looking at the, the use of media servers. It should hopefully, uh, you know, playing around with that, we can see just how far we can scale that before it becomes an issue. Yeah, great. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Scott. And, uh, and oh, sorry, one more question. Apologies. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, great work. How you handle contradictions in the editing of something when multiple people would... Okay, uh, so if you like, I'll just give you a, a quick demo, because I did prepare one earlier. Um, so, for example, this is uh, just a, a test that we did using two instantiations over the internet. So you can see there that we're synchronising navigation. I hope you guys can see that. Um, and then also uh, track selection uh, becomes synchronous. Um, so it doesn't matter which collaborator is, is selecting. That works both ways. Collaborator 1 is the generator of MIDI time code and uh, MIDI machine control. So that is the one that controls playback. Then we can synchronize fader uh, positions, yeah, both for level faders and panning. But then we can also uh, for example, use a, an insert plugin. Uh, and what we did here is we just used a stock standard Cubase Pro compressor. Coming up in just a sec. Which brings up the compressor instantiation on both machines. And so that way we can now start doing the, you know, the insert editing. And once again, that synchronous across every single Cubase Pro instantiation. Um, we're also incorporating uh, key commands, keyboard shortcuts, um, for things like split a cursor, for example, um, moving things around. So once again, a keystroke will generate uh, the MIDI data and then convert it at the DCIA. Okay, one more question. How do, you deal with, how do you deal with conflict between two people wanting to control, say, the same fader at the same time? What's your rules there? Right, so we, uh, with every piece of control data, we've uh, added a tag at the start to identify who's actually sending the data. And then, it, we haven't shown that in this prototype, but we've now got filter check boxes so we can filter people in and out as, as we need to. So, uh, for example, if I were demonstrating something to an entire collaboration, I can filter out everyone sending data to me, but they can still receive all of mine. And so we can just selectively turn on and off their, their data channel streams. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. Okay, I'd now like to introduce uh, Anna Shambo, one of the most busy people at this conference. Uh, so, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, she's going to be talking about facilitating team-based programming learning with web audio, and we'll just give her a second to set up. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Miriam. And shall I check the audio or it will be hold on? <clears throat> yeah, it should be good. Okay, so welcome. Uh, we'll explain a little bit on this experience or the adventure uh, this past year of a 
course on web audio in a special master that we have here. So I would like to give some context first of this master and this research. We have this project called NT and U Salto project that stands for Student Active Learning in a Two Campuses Organization. And this is an alignment with an, like an NTNU approach to collaboration, so in different domains uh, and disciplines and specialities, they have like this uh, working in teams, so uh, interactive or interdisciplinary teams is important to solve complex problems, and uh, we are in alignment of this approach. So in the background you see the R2, which is another um, auditorium, uh, sort of auditorium, but it's designed for collaboration with high-tech technology, different screens, and you can have a look maybe during these days to see how this looks like. And NTNU Salt is a collaboration between NTNU, of course, and University of Oslo. And the idea here is also to explore new ways of teaching and learning, and that means everything, collaborative learning, flipping classroom, physical virtual interactions, uh, team-based learning, so all the new ways of teaching and learning, we are exploring those avenues with some risks as well. Uh, we presented a paper at NIME uh, earlier this year already explaining, so this is a follow-up. So this master, uh, Music Communication and Technology, is uh, uh, now we are started the second year, it's a two-year master, many of the volunteers here belong to this master, so you can also discuss with them how it looks like. And the idea with this master is also a collaboration between University of Oslo and NTNU, and we have this cross-disciplinary and also cross-campus space. So the, we have half of the students are co-located and the other half are remotely uh, on the same class. And then the teacher could be in either side or maybe in another location. So this is the portal, we have this portal space, and we have Robin Stocker here, who has designed the main brain of this space. And we are also exploring all the possible technologies that support uh, network music and network communication. So listing Tico, Lola, NDI, Dante, Chuck Trip, and it's really every day we're exploring new technologies, and well, that's part of the research, but also part of the, the master study. And, well, the idea is that we have a replication of the portal in the two sides, two universities, but the vision is that we also connect with other uh, centers or schools and other nodes, if you like. So activities that we have been doing, this is one on mute, maybe you've seen that online, we have this um, monthly uh, series of women in music technology who come to the portal and give these talks, and then we have audience from the two sides, uh, Oslo and Trondheim, but also online viewers, as we are having here. Um, then we also have, um, this is an example of, a, of the physical computing workshop that we developed uh, in, well, it's a course of this master, and we presented at NIME, and then this challenge of how to teach physical computing when half of the students are on the other side and they are collaborating across campus. Yes, and then we have also, we launched very recently this uh, series of uh, lectures, uh, guest lectures of, with experts in um, uh, sonic design and sonification. So here is Pedro Pestana, but you can find online also, we made it public, talks uh, by Oiben Brandstek and also Daniel Former and many other uh, experts in the field. And you can see also the context, so we have students in the two sides and then the speaker could be in one of the two or connected remotely. So these are the kind of activities within the portal. And also the vision of this master is that we develop these 21st century skills, uh, which is merging humanities and technology and entrepreneurship. And then we can see programming uh, as also one of these 21st century skills so that we make sure that um, yeah, we are prepared as a students for the 21st century and um, technological or te technology literacy. So, as mentioned, this research builds on a previous workshop, the physical computing workshop, and the main finding was, so the approach was to explore hybrid technologies, and that was too much for the begin, like, so for uh, beginners in programming. And we addressed that in this second edition, but yeah, 
from that the idea was the programming skill was not very much developed. Yes, the, like the prototyping was developed, but programming um, didn't, didn't improve from the beginning to the end of the workshop. So with this um, research, the idea was to see, okay, what if we, so how, is it, how to teach programming in two weeks, intense week, uh, using one single, like one single technology, in this case Webodio, whether, what are the challenges and opportunities uh, teaching with this uh, web audio, uh, whether that can improve these uh, programming skills. And you can find in the literature there have been already approaches of using web audio in courses related to STEAM or this idea of um, yes, um, the STEM plus the arts uh, and successful examples in a way. So here are listed some of them. Uh, for instance, uh, this Creative Coding, coding Summer Cam by uh, Alison et al. They were exploring the combination of Zebra, TonJS, and so on. Um, also, examples with EarSketch. We saw yesterday a couple of related presentations on that, which is an, an online environment, as you saw, to learn to code by making music. Code Circle is another example that combines or promotes this audiovisual um, uh, kind of um, interactive experiences, or also there's another example on Queen uh, uh, where you can also um, explore music technology concepts through interactive experiences. So yeah, this paper then takes really inspired by Alison et al. For instance, this approach of uh, teaching web audio and audio programming, but also showcasing different libraries, so then they get uh, students get familiar or exposed to different ways. So both the lower level and then higher level. And the aim of this course, which was an intern course uh, of two weeks, I'll explain it, uh, was to create a known project at the end. And yeah, just in this context of interdisciplinary teams where there are expert programmers, those who haven't been exposed to programming, uh, so this common problem of novices and experts. So we started the kind of the session with this mind map that it's nice to share. Maybe it's visible, hopefully. Uh, what are the pros and cons of um, web audio? So that's, that comes from the first class, and the idea was, OK, uh, positive. So it's easy to distribute. There's no need of plugins, uh, multiple online resources. Uh, it is open source, accessible content. It enhances the user experiences. There are no external libraries and so on. We, we know, but also but the cons. So it's difficult for beginners. It really depends on your prior knowledge, requires knowledge on web technologies, and we will get back to that. And um, it varies. Uh, it depends on security, APIs, external libraries. So it's really, um, it changes over time. So the course, you can have a look if you would like to see more of the curriculum and for by days and in the paper. But just to say that this approach is um, an intense course of uh, like uh, eight days uh, in a row. And that's uh, all, this is in alignment with the master that we do this kind of very intense workshop. So then you get exposed to that technology and then you move on. And the first week they were asked to create a mini project, second week a group project. And I would like to show you the results of the second week uh, after working these individual um, ideas, and then they team into three groups. So this is the first one, Touch the Alien. Um, I'm not sure there, there are students here, with, but you can see. So uh, the idea is um, they were also reporting all the projects writing in, in a blog. Uh, they do that also across the different courses, so I'll show you the blog. But it's uh, basically a web audio scene. And it's using as technologies web audio API, CSS, HTML5, and audio effects uh, of the library Tuna. And the idea here was to create a, like a touch synthesizer, if you like. <clears throat> so this is in the, so this one is the MCD, the um, uh, block of the students. But we can go, I guess, right to the, Loading. Yeah. 
yeah. Another project was, and well, here they were looking very much that it's uh, also um, uh, adapted to the different platforms. Then we have the Magic Piano, which was, uh, uh, and the idea here was uh, to create a musical instrument for, for kids who are learning to play uh, like an instrument and then they don't know the melody, so no matter what key you press, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound okay. It's going to sound the... <laughs> so it's a nice, kind environment. And as you can see, technologies. Uh, they were using Web uh, MIDI API, Nexus UI, TonJS, JSON, uh, CSS, and MIDI keyboard. And it supports two songs, at least during that moment. Maybe they have developed more. And there is this very nice video. So you will see the, also the authors and everything in these blog posts and all the description. Um, but this comes yeah, from Let's the daughter of uh, Guy. Uh, And then the uh, third and last project is uh, Convol Convolverizer. And it's working with uh, Convolver, well, and technology-wise, they're using P5.js, which uh, they saw in a previous, in the physical computing workshop, and then sound card, a guitar, and, and a microphone. Very quickly, because we're running out of time. Uh, I think that's the one. Or, yeah. You might recognize faces because they've been some students here. It's, uh, it's a student-led blog, and they usually report everything they do. So similarities is that they build this um, code. Uh, yeah, so they built, they first uh, built uh, the code individually during the first week, and then the challenge was to merge the code together doing this group project, so that was interesting for them. And also like this combination of different web technologies, combination of software and hardware. Then we did a pre and post questionnaire, uh, following also a similar approach to the nine paper. Uh, you can have a look on, uh, more closely in the, in the written um, research. So, but I would like to highlight, so in the NIME workshop, the programming really was no, no improvement. Yes, the, it was an improvement with the prototyping, but no programming. Here, I mean, it's not like a, a big jump, but at least there is some progress. Uh, then in terms of the description of programming applied to interactive musical systems, it, it's slightly improved as well. But uh, in terms of applying this notion of programming in uh, NIME interfaces or interactive musical prototypes uh, was not, not very much better. But also from the students' comments, so they enjoy the content, the course uh, learning process, but still this idea of being a novice programmer uh, seems to be um, a problem. So reflections. Uh, overall, so learning to how to program is we have this myth idea of, oh yeah, yeah, so in four, like eight days, you, I will become a great programmer. So it's, it's not that, that's not true, and there is evidence that you, it can take 10 years until you get to become a, an expert programmer. Therefore, when teaching programming, uh, they should, this also suggest uh, to uh, uh, kind of promote effective novices and teach strategies instead of knowledge, so really change the way of uh, programming so that, yeah, uh, acknowledging that you will be a novice programmer for a long time. And conclusion, so we can recommend to use Web Audio to teach audio programming to a mixed group of mostly novices uh, if, 
And from this experience, there is a fair combination of both individual and group work. Uh, the students and teacher use the same code edit editor for consistency. That's what we found that it's very important we have the same environment. And it is possible to share the code at all times if you have a problem. So uh, promoting also this group or um, yeah, cooperative way of, of learning. So debugging also, experiencing the debugging experience in collaboration and cross campus, that, that's interesting as well. So, however, we found this pre-knowledge of web technologies are very important to just use web audio, otherwise you can get stuck to that. So that's something, it's a pre-knowledge requirement. And as said, uh, we should focus on effective novices. Thank you very much. Dozen Tak. Thank you very much, Anna, and I would love to have a magic piano in my life to improve my piano playing. <laughs> <laughs> no end. So have we got any questions? Yes, yeah, one here. Uh, should we start up here? You, you have a question. Yeah. Okay, we'll start, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, how you measure the, the improvement of the programming tasks of the, of the students? Is it just from the comments or is there any further test? The programming skills of the students, how you measure them? Well, so far we did this student feedback with this Likert scale okay, and they comments. Just said I, but okay. yeah, I guess, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe it would be nice to measure from the code, right? From well, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not so easy, I guess, but, uh, mm -hmm. but you just ask them. But for maybe now. doing like... The, you, like there is this sentimental analysis, maybe doing that applied to code. So perhaps? at least they have the impression that they improved, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. And this question up here from Tony. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, Anna. So I think we've talked about this um, as well, um, but I teach coding and, and audio and graphics to high schoolers. And one of the things that I realize that they really, if they have no programming experience, is that's the text that throws them off. Like they're trying to figure out why I'm writing some kind of text and it's gonna result in this case in sound. And I know you have a lot of music students, but are there certain ways you've thought of like outside the keyboard or like a physical sort of activity to get them to kind of understand, even if it's just like a signal chain? Because I mean, I was a musician that you can kind of understand, well, my guitar gets plugged into this and into the amp. But if they aren't coming from a musical background either, have you thought of some things um, to get them away from the computer to kind of understand the concept first before it goes into, you know, all text? So in this uh, MCD parameter, uh, music is uh, an important factor. It means that most of the students have musical interest or background, mm -hmm. which means that then the music has been really the way of say, like hook them in a way to say, you know, you will get to create something musical, so then you need to follow that. But haven't explored this other way, like not music experience, not, not musical experiences. But I would say something that a, mot a motivation or a skill that the students are really yeah, interested, then that can be the excuse to then suffer a little bit, if you like, or, but also, yeah, then suffering less. Yeah, no, that's right. It could be interesting to see where these workshops go if it's like people who have an interest in music but don't have like a traditional musical background. Mm -hmm. It could be interesting. Because I think that's an interesting aspect that coding could, or programming like in the mm -hmm. Web Audio API could be a way for people who aren't traditional musicians to make music. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to see where your next level of your workshop goes if it had like for anybody who had an interest in music but maybe not a musical yeah. background. Yeah. yeah, great work. Thanks. Well, thanks for the, you know, your work. Yeah, sure, thanks. <laughs> great, thanks very much. I think we're going to yeah. move on because I don't want to be late for lunch because I know how important that is. Yeah. So uh, massive thank Perfect. you to, <laughs> to Anna. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so finally in this session we have Cosmos Kritzis, I'll get his name right, this time, um, uh, who's going to talk about a web uh, platform for science education through music activities. Thank uh, you. Hello everyone, I will try to, to be as fast uh, as possible in order to have lunch the soonest also. Uh, so, uh, today I will present you the iMusica project. It was developed during the last three years. 
it's already ended the, uh, let's say, the funding. Uh, it was under the European Union Horizon 2020 program. And there were more than those partners in the project, uh, but mostly today, since it is the web audio conference, I will try to focus mostly on the uh, activity environments developed in this uh, platform that deal with music or with audio. So, what exactly is the, the iMusica project? Uh, iMusica means interactive music, science, collaborative, collaborative activities. So, it is a, a platform for supporting STEM education, science, technology, engineering, arts, uh, math, uh, mathematics, and uh, iMusica brings arts in order to make this process more engaging uh, to, to the children, and also uh, it, uh, there are some uh, specific, uh, there are some uh, uh, studies that shows that actually arts can enhance the learning process and also music can enhance the higher, uh, let's say, um, the, the better performance on, uh, on, on learning. So, actually, this uh, project uh, provides real evidence of, uh, of the positive impact in this learning uh, uh, process and also enhances the creativity and innovation between uh, the, the learners. So, the general architecture, it is, as you can see, we, there are many activity environments, there are music tools, visualizations, so most all of those tools are actually different uh, iframe elements. They are all of them, uh, since each partner was responsible for his own tool, they were served from their own uh, web server, so somehow we needed to find a way uh, in order to communicate uh, between those uh, uh, environments. So the Musaika Workbench is mostly a client-side uh, uh, application, uh, with the only uh, server-side uh, part being the Musica Management Platform, which is used in as a cloud service for storing uh, the user-generated data. So, uh, Oh, sorry, I forgot here actually to mention that uh, the communication among all of those uh, activity environments happen uh, with the Postal JS. I will explain to it uh, now. So the communication framework uh, it was developed based on the Postal JS uh, library. Uh, it was important for us to build such a framework because all of the uh, different applications have their own delays. Uh, they need, since they are in different servers and all of those uh, uh, data are on the client side, somehow they needed to intercommunicate. So we used uh, the Postal JS uh, library. Uh, actually, this facilitates the performance of, uh, of the whole workbench. And actually, this intercommunication happens uh, with the Postal X-Frame uh, plugin in order to federate the different, uh, the different domains. Um, and this is an example of how the, the communication framework uh, works. So each one of the tools needed to, the tools or the activity environments needed to somehow uh, specify their unique uh, identifier and you can see it in the line number two. And then each tool, for example, here in this uh, snippet, uh, the performance uh, environment wants to send to clipboard some data. And similarly, it can receive the data from the clipboard. So, also, since most of those uh, environments generate audio or they analyze audio, somehow we needed to have a centralized control uh, of, of the audio routing. This is, let's say, the heart, and it is called the Audio Manager, and it was developed with, uh, based on the Web Audio API. 
Uh, so, how this happens is that all of the each of the environments either it has to to work as a transmitter or or a receiver. So, if it is a transmitter, it needs to get the audio manager, the audio context from the audio manager. Then it needs to create the transmitting node and share this node with the uh, with the audio manager. And this is let's say the, an example a snippet, you can see it on the left. Uh, also the receiver node, it needs to get again the, the audio context from the audio manager, create the, the receiving node and share it again back to the audio manager. Uh, it may be sound of tricky because you can see that the transmitter has a receive audio from node while the receiver has send audio to node. But have in mind that this has to do with the central audio manager. So the, each tool informs the central audio manager what are the intentions. So uh, not only this, we have uh, the sound uh, recorder, we have metronome, I will show you all of those tools, but I wanted to say specifically here that it's recording, it is a, it is a WAV audio, okay? So it is raw data, it is stored uh, as a blob uh, object on the browser. So transferring it between the different environments, it was quite difficult, it was quite harsh. So we tried to somehow find a, a, a compression uh, algorithm that it will be fast enough, that it will minimize a lot the, the, the footprint, the, the, the storage footprint, and uh, also be able to transmit it with uh, the Postal JS. And this was achieved with the LZ string uh, compression library. And it, it compresses and decompresses. Actually, the compression, it uses UTF-16 strings in order to encode and compress the data. And this is, can also uh, help us to, this also helped us to easily transmit uh, with PostalJS uh, the, the data. Also, the audio manager, uh, provides to the metronome the timer based on the current time uh, property of the web audio API in order to calculate the bit intervals and uh, the selected tempo. And also all of the tools uh, are synchronized based on the, on the metronome tool. So we also, the, the sound of, uh, of the instruments that I will show you later, uh, it is based on the Modalis engine. It is a physical model-based sound synthesis engine. Uh, so the sounding objects, you, you can specify specific sounding objects like strings, bars, membranes. There are also tubes, but in the, in the, in the scope of the iMusica project, we used only these uh, three objects and also you can interact with these objects uh, with uh, specific interactions such as striking, bow bowing or plucking. But the important thing is that this sound is actually generated in real time. It is generated based on uh, the physical uh, parameters and based on the physical phenomena that exist and of how sound actually works. So it is not a sample, it is not a, anything, something like this. It is sinusoids uh, produced with a specific, uh, based on the specific physical parameters. And, but as you can imagine, this was a quite heavy library. So in order to use it uh, on the browser, we tried to make many, many improvements. And finally, we did it to use them. Actually, we use the script and trans transpiler, which is to tra transpile C++ code to JavaScript. And also with web workers uh, and uh, with a web assembly module, we made it uh, easily to, to run on the browser. So let's see a demo. So, 
Actually, here you can see there are the, these are the activity environments. They are organized with different colors according to, to the different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, to, 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 to the different uh, to the different functionalities or to the different things that the students can, can do. So here with a blue are there more mathematic, uh, let's say, tools. In the middle we have the more uh, technological tools and on the right we have the musical tools. Uh, starting with a musical whiteboard. It is a, a simple environment where it is also an, it, in, it, it enables also the users to use a, a, a pen in order to draw. I apologize for this. I don't know why it is so laggy. So you can have you have different colors uh, corresponding to different sounds. You can also uh, have keep uh, the note uh, straight. Uh, oh, what else we have here? I don't know. Okay, because uh, this is we have also a developing. Uh, it is under development. Some of those tools. Uh, we have more settings in, in this given tool and actually this can af be affected also by the metronome. So if I change the time signature, it should also change on the, on the tool. No? Why? There is also the performance uh, sampler, which actually it, it works like a sampler. Uh, the students can uh, record uh, their, their, their sounds or they can record from the microphone. And you can, they can import the, the sounds here. They have the choice to, to use up to, to four different waveforms. And you can choose, uh, let's say, parts. So I can I don't know what's going on. I really don't know what's going on why it is so lucky. Okay. You can also have uh, random samples in here. and the random, uh, let's say, generator of arrangements. Okay, I, I, because it is too laggy at the moment, I don't know why, I, I, I think that it will not be that performant. Let me try to open it. I open it with Chrome. Oh, it's the computer. No. Let me. Okay. Uh, here now we have uh, another uh, environment which is. Uh, the tone synthesizer. Here the children uh, can, uh, here actually the user, here the user 
can uh, choose up to uh, 10 uh, different sinusoids. Uh, he can specify their parameters like the amplitude and uh, okay, here it's the amplitude. So actually, let me. So here they can see how the additive synthesis actually works. They can measure the different. Uh, uh, they, they can actually see the different. The different uh, frequencies and how this summarizes uh, to a bigger to a, a single. Uh, sound, for example. Like this. And they can keep on watching how they, the waveform, by adding the, the different sinusoids, what is the waveform produced. And also you can see And also, you can see the different sinusoids that add to the to, to the sound. Actually, also here we can we have used the the lip motion. The lip motion sensor. Uh, I think most of of the people here know what is the lip motion. It is a, a sensor that actually recognizes, uh, it tracks uh, the hands. And here, whenever I introduce uh, an extended finger on the field of view of the lip motion, it adds a, a different Sinusoid. And it works more or less like a, an air theremin, let's say, because according to the height, you, you tweak the, the volume, and uh, with the left and right, you, you choose uh, the, the note. But also, in order to be more, uh, more interactive, You can choose specific scales, so... I apologize for this, I, I don't know the laptop today... If you try it uh, on, your, on your laptops, you will see that it's... It's not the, this uh, performance, it is too laggy, and I don't know why. So other environments include the 3D virtual instrument design, where actually the modalis engine is used here, is employed here. Uh, So, for example, we have uh, the monochord here. The, the children can actually change the parameters of, of the instrument. They can see it around. They can choose the material of the strings. They, they can choose the force of the tension applied on the string. Cosmos, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop you there because we've run out of time. Um, but will you be around over lunch to answer questions and to yeah, give people yeah, demonstrations? I'm
actually, this is, the platform is used uh, for, uh, for secondary education. Um, we have also many visualizations. Uh, you can check it out by going to, to this to these uh, web pages. And uh, again, I apologize for this performance. I also wanted to present you the Acuscope uh, that we also developed this, uh, uh, this device. It is actually to measure the impulse response of uh, surfaces. And uh, it, it is connected uh, with uh, the browser. and uh, it communicates with the browser uh, with uh, web Bluetooth. Uh, so what, how does this work? It is actually, it has uh, uh, two transducers. Uh, one is used to, this one is used to, to actually resonate the surface. And this is actually used to sense the resonances of, oh, sorry, is used to, to yes, is used to, to sense the resonances. And then an F, uh, a Fourier transform is, is running on the device, and we get the analysis back to, to the interface uh, with, a, with a web Bluetooth. And this requires actually the, to have at least a Bluetooth 4.2 in order to, to work with this. Uh, Okay, can we give uh, Cosmos a big uh, round of applause? And thank you, and we'll speak to everyone. All right, thank you very much. So now it's time for making the picture of all of us. Please, Anna is there, so you can uh, follow Anna and uh, to find the place. We'll th we'll have three pictures all together, then volunteers, and then committee. Thank you.
Ke...
We have, uh, we'll continue our legendary series of talks with uh, Stephen Yee, uh, Louver Sigurdsson, and Edward Costello on the C-Sound Web IDE. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, today I'll be talking about a uh, online C-Sound Web IDE. Um, and just a bit of an agenda, talking a little bit about CSound and its current ecosystem. Uh, and then I'll talk about the Web IDE and talk about our project goals. Uh, and then spend some time demonstrating where we're at with the system. Uh, and then conclude with some future work. So uh, for those who may or may, or may not know about CSound, um, it is a sound and music computing system uh, that is fully programmable via its uh, domain-specific language. Uh, it's been around since 1986. Uh, it has its roots in music and systems, uh, tracing back to Music 4. Uh, and um, it's really evolved over the many years that it's been around. Um, uh, currently, uh, well, I would say that Originally, CSound was a kind of command line program. You would write code, you would run CSound, execute the code, and out would come an audio file. And then you would iterate upon this over and over again as your kind of process to make music. Right? That was in 1986. Um, in the 90s, we had real-time audio, uh, interactive audio, uh, audio systems. Um, and in the 2000s, uh, CSound really changed. Uh, the system of CSound became not uh, an executable, but a library that could be embedded within other systems. Um, the current center of the CSound ecosystem is libccsound, uh, and it has a C and C++ API. It has a number of language bindings uh, in Java, uh, Go, Rust. Uh, people have used it from Lisp uh, and JavaScript via Node. Um, it has been ported to a variety of platforms, uh, running on embedded systems, mobile, uh, desktop, and supercomputer. Uh, and since 2014, uh, it has been present on the web platform. All right. So at the Web Audio Conference, um, we've uh, presented a few times uh, about different versions of CSound that have been compiled to run as asm.js, uh, compiled into portable native client, uh, and uh, last year, we presented on a WebAssembly version of CSound that ran with the audio worklet and script processor node. Uh, a brief view of our current ecosystem. We have CSound uh, running within the browsers. We have it running on desktop systems, uh, embedded platforms like Bella and Raspberry Pi, uh, mobile systems like Android and iOS. Uh, and CSound has been run uh, with um, in platforms like Unity and Unreal, as well as Node.js. Right. Um, I mention this because uh, what I'm going to show about this web IDE is a, a kind of an entry point into this ecosystem that starts on the web. Right? It allows us to uh, kind of get started with CSound uh, in one place and then take that work uh, and that knowledge and move it to other platforms. So some use cases, what do people use CSound for? Well, synthesis and sound processing and composition, classically. Uh, sound design, uh, I would say also interactive real-time audio uh, systems. Uh, and also in the past eight, 10 years, uh, increasingly for um, embedding it within music applications. Um, also for education, CSound has long been used for teaching computer music. Uh, and for commercialization, using CSound within commercial applications. Uh, it's permissible due to its uh, LGPL license. So the Web IDE, it's a, kind of a new project. It's uh, almost beta at this point, um, and I'll show uh, where it is today. Uh, it's a browser-based IDE for CSound, project creation and dissemination. Uh, it's a zero install solution. Uh, you just load it. It loads uh, the WebAssembly version of CSound, uh, and uh, it's a consistent environment. Right? So uh, for, for me, one of the, the big things about um, uh, using computer music tools and teaching with it is it's really hard to deal with the number of different varieties of uh, students' computers, and as well as trying to work with uh, very locked down labs uh, we're kind of excited that this can run within the browser. Uh, and we're looking at this as a community platform 
for our Seatown community uh, to kind of build up uh, a number of things which I'll mention in a moment. So our goals. Uh, technical goals. Uh, one, we want to recreate the desktop-based development practice that people have had for many years using Csound uh, on their desktop systems. Uh, and to do that, that means that we had the requirement to have uh, support for multi-file projects. Right? Uh, in Csound, you can have includes, which is what people often do to modularize their code. Um, we also needed the support for resource files, or like loading audio samples uh, and data text files. And really what we wanted to do is kind of recreate the file system experience and the way of organizing projects via file system uh, within the browser. Uh, we wanted to support both real-time uh, projects and uh, rendering to disk, because these are both classic uh, kind of ways that Csound is used. Uh, and I think those are most of the, the kind of major initial goals that we're, um, we're looking for. And I'll discuss some further goals in uh, future work. In terms of ecosystem, uh, we have goals for uh, this system to be a place where we can create new projects, uh, a system that we can learn uh, or discover other people's work, uh, a place to learn about C-Sound usage and practice, learn from each other, uh, and hopefully to build up an com online uh, community hub for the practice of using CSound. And um, ideally, a place to kind of maintain the history of these projects and to build up a history of work online. So uh, I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time demoing. Uh, first thing I'll show is kind of just the site where it is today. Uh, about accounts and profiles, some social features that we've had uh, implemented so far. Uh, I'll walk you through a project um, using the editor and how we can look up documentation. Um, and then I'll do kind of two demonstrations, uh, one of a classic kind of desktop-based workflow um, that um, for rendering uh, in real time and rendering to disk for uh, composing. And then uh, a second demonstration with uh, live coding-based workflows, uh, which could be useful for um, in the process of teaching, uh, as well as while you compose, and maybe as a system for performance. OK. So the address of the site is uh, ide.csound.com. Uh, this is currently where it's at. And if you go to the page, you'll see that it's, it's very barren at the moment. Uh, just the front page just says it's currently under development. Uh, there is a login area in the upper right. On the left, there is a, a drawer that sh slides in with uh, persistent links to the site documentation, uh, telling you, you know, what to do, uh, how to get around the site. It's uh, also kind of being filled in at the moment. Uh, we have a link for reporting issues and a link to the GitHub project because this site is also open source. Uh, and I will mention that um, the site, uh, it's a bit in the paper, uh, we're using uh, on the client side React, uh, Inscriptin, especially the Inscriptin file system, uh, and uh, WebAssembly uh, version of Csound, um, and Material UI. Uh, for our server side, we are actually using Firebase for um, hosting and for all of its other services. So let's say I wanted to start using the web IDE. Now, there will be a search, a global search feature for searching across the, the site. Uh, it's not yet there. But uh, for now, I'll go through this login process. Uh, you can create a new account through email or password or through uh, OAuth authentication through Google and Facebook. And I will use Google. Uh, and now I'm logged in. So once I'm logged in, I can go to my profile page. And you'll see I have uh, a photo, some biographical information, some links to myself, uh, and a list of my projects. Right. If you want to view projects, I'm going to show this in an uh, incognito browser. 
the profile there is uh, ide.csound.com slash profile slash Stephen Yee. You would see, sorry, you would see uh, there's a bit of a break there with the, the link, but you can also view my profile as a non-logged in user, and you can go and explore the projects. For example, if you wanted to see uh, what projects I have tagged with uh, Web Audio Conference 2019, you can see I have them there. You could uh, um, say, oh, Stephen's got a version of John Chowning's Stria that was uh, reconstructed by Kevin DeHaan. Um, is that uh, audio play? Uh, OK, let me try. Yeah. All right. So. Um, you know, in, in terms of history, we're talking about a project that was uh, done in 2007, uh, I guess through 2010, and um, it's a kind of C-sound version of John Chowning's Stria that, um, for our all intents and purposes, we hope to be persistent and enduring for many, many years uh, through this system. Uh, we could go in and explore, learn about uh, his usage of uh, parallel carrier, uh, single modulator, FM synthesis, so on, right? So if I go back, I might try, uh, say, clicking on this button to hear what this project might sound like. All right. Prior to actually going to check out the project, uh, maybe kind of a quickly audition like this playlist of everyone's projects and say, oh, that sounds really interesting. I'll go check it out, All right? And again, in terms of History. This project, uh, Trapped and Convert by Dr. Richard Boulanger, uh, was written in 1979 for Music 11, uh, rewritten in, or updated in 1986, and, uh, and also in 1996, and runs today in the browser in this platform. Right. Now I'm back to uh, my own logged in view, and I can see that uh, I have a, a number of uh, my friends, Ed and uh, Kluver that I'm following, and I can go and click on the, them to see their profiles and see their projects as well. I can get their information and uh, see their links to their, uh, uh, their websites. And you can say hello to Flubber. <laughs> and this is the, the aspect of trying to have a social platform uh, and a place that we can um, learn about each other and learn about each other's works. So I will uh, show now um, the kind of idea that, uh, let's say I'm uh, working in C sound uh, in a kind of classic way. I might be writing some code. In this case, this was um, in response to a question on the C sound list about uh, do we have a cubic interpolation uh, system for um, randomized lines? And I kind of wrote something, and I ran it. All right, sorry. Yeah, uh, but uh, we can imagine that I was uh, working on this and coding it, uh, and then maybe I wanted to render the disk. All right. So uh, in the background, we don't have a, a spinner at the moment. Um, it's actually using a web worker and running the uh, WebAssembly version of Zsound as fast as possible. Uh, and it is rendering this piece. And it is now downloaded to my computer. I can open it in VLC. And I have the WAV file that was generated. <laughs> Show very quickly the live coding kind of system. So uh, in here, I have another project example where I have um, my live code.org kind of library of user code for live coding. Uh, I'm going to press R to run the project, and in this session, I have a kind of uh, empty uh, kind of just some starter code. And 
and then maybe I'll So you can see that you could be uh, generating new instruments, uh, live coding, experimenting. Uh, in this case, I'm using a, a sample that I uploaded. Right? And if I wanted to, say, add a new audio file, I could load this sample from the dirt sample set. Wait a moment. Hopefully, yep. Uh, replace what audio file I'm using. Right. Okay, uh, I will stop here uh, with this part. So you can see that uh, we do have uh, audio file sample upload, we have a file system, we have the ability to export the project as a zip file, then you can run it on your desktop, uh, use it elsewhere. Uh, and I will just go really quickly through future work. Um, we've gotten pretty far. Uh, we're probably getting close to an open beta, uh, and we still have to implement things like code completion. Uh, Web MIDI and audio input is available through C Sound, uh, the Web Audio C Sound, but we don't have it exposed in the Web IDE yet. Uh, visualization, oscilloscopes and spectrograms, uh, global search, uh, social features like likes, uh, the ability to quickly share to other social media platforms like Twitter, um, and other kinds of things that come from social code coding platforms like CodePen and Glitch, uh, the idea for project forking, uh, template projects, uh, anonymous projects for just quickly going in and editing. Um, for us, having a GUI editor will be a very nice thing. Um, offline usage and then uh, hopefully, we'll look at exporting to Cabbage so that we can build uh, VST and AUs, uh, audio units, uh, exporting to my own program, Blue, uh, looking at um, things uh, like web audio modules and web audio plugins, and maybe exporting standalone applications uh, from the, the web IDE. Okay, so that's it. Um, hopefully, uh, if you have a chance to experiment with this, maybe uh, take a note of, uh, we'll probably be um, opening it up for general usage uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, yeah, okay, thank you very much. All right, all right. do we have any questions for Stephen? Just as a note, I'll be checking the Slack channel, uh, WAC 2019, so if you have questions there too. Hi, thank you a lot. Um, I'm just curious how much of this is open source? Uh, like you mentioned, there's a back end running in Firebase, and yeah. the user interface is all running in the browser. Yeah, yeah. The only part that might be considered closed is Firebase. Um, everything else is the source code for the, the front end is on GitHub. Uh, what C Sound is open source, LGPL2, uh, just about everything else is open source. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. So, for social features, are you thinking about 
so when you get when you share projects on social media, will they be in an iframe or will you make a sort of recording, an audio or video that will be shared? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, for sharing, no. I think it's like links to the project so that you, people can go in. Um, as it is now, as an anonymous user, you can still look at other people's projects. You can't save anything. But you can actually run other people's projects, go in, look at their code. Uh, the, the, I think the, the, the next thing to do from there is for, uh, project forking, so that if you look at a project that you think it looks interesting, fork it to your, yourself, your own projects, and then start editing, and then experiment. They're getting ready. I'll ask one more, I guess. Yeah. Um, so social networks tend to have a fairly uh, standardized structure at the yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed anything? Are you planning anything uh, specifically for making music through C-Sound that to change the network or make it better suited for um, this kind of process? I think project? it's kind of early for us, right? So uh, we, we just needed to get the, the, the groundwork going. I think it's going to be a, a kind of iterative process to see what comes out of the, the social features that we are putting in. Um, I think we're looking at CodePen a lot um, uh, as a kind of model, and also Glitch.me uh, as kind of ways to see um, how social coding is kind of going about in, in those worlds, and seeing how we might be able to um, uh, learn from that for, for ourselves. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. Great. Thank you. All right, so we're on to our next presenter, um, building an intuitive web-based musical instrument with Ashish Dubey. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, just setting up my display. All right. So uh, I'm Ashish, and uh, Is that better? Okay. So uh, I'm Ashish, and uh, I'll be presenting uh, some of my work that I've been doing uh, on a project that aims to be uh, a very easy um, musical instrument and a tool for composition, uh, it's like basic composition for people who don't have a lot of uh, musical knowledge. So um, I'll be talking about uh, how the idea came into being and uh, how I built it. And uh, basically, I'll also show us a small demo and uh, what are the future possibilities. So I'll just uh, take a minute uh, to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ashish, and uh, I work as a software engineer at Grofers, which is a retail company based out of India. I work with the DevOps and release engineering team there, so it has nothing to do with audio music stuff. But uh, like most of you, uh, I have some interest in audio and tech. Uh, so. This is some stuff that I do in my spare time. So um, the idea began um, by me having a desire to have a way to basically generate some music out of uh, visual artifacts, like a painting. Um, the idea was like really vague, and honestly, I didn't know, I didn't have any clue how to build it. So um, that just lingered on. Um, and um, over time, I came across this uh, application uh, called Music Mouse. Um, that is, uh, in, in case uh, you guys don't know, Music Mouse was an application built by Laurie Spiegel um, back in the 80s. And as, an, as a very intuitive uh, musical uh, instrument uh, for people who don't know, uh, who don't want to like, learn music theory and play music. And recently, uh, Tero, um, who's, who's a prolific music hacker, uh, he uh, wrote an emulation of that, and uh, so so this kind of um, this kind of helped me uh, scope my vision, uh, scope my direction to basically uh, building something uh, that is easy to play. Uh, plus, uh, there's some visual uh, there's there's some uh, visual painting artifact also involved in that. So uh, here I, here is uh, wh where my project started. Um, it didn't look like this at all. Um, also, it wasn't called Paste Loops. Um, it was a very um, very simple interface uh, which had a canvas, uh, a white canvas, which was attached to a synth node, um, which was generating sawtooth waves. Um, 
But over time, uh, I, I worked on it, um, and uh, it seemed uh, like it could be an application which could be used by uh, musicians or also people who uh, are just getting introduced to music uh, in a funny, intuitive way. So, um, yeah. So uh, this is just uh, calling out. Um, bef so while I was working on this, I uh, came across this book uh, by Thor. Um, and uh, basically, the contents of this book, uh, the instrumentation model, uh, because I, I'm, not a, I'm not a researcher, uh, so uh, this, this kind of gave me a structural approach to building this instrument uh, as just a web developer. So this kind of helped. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about um, my, my application in terms of uh, different components. Um, I'll start with the user interface, what, what it is and what it lets you do. Uh, so basically, it's a canvas uh, with basic drawing tools, uh, draw, erase, clear, canvas. And uh, you have a panel for scale selection. Uh, a person can choose a scale in which they want to play. Uh, and uh, there's a brush texture selection, which also uh, modifies the sound. And uh, volume temp tempo controls uh, for basic uh, musical controls. And uh, all of this uh, was built with uh, Tone.js, P5.js, and uh, React, and design, uh, basic stuff. Um, I'm going to uh, pull out. Uh, a different tab to just uh, show what it looks like. So uh, it's also live. I'll post the link on the Slack channel so you guys can play with it. So basically, this is the canvas, and uh, there is uh, there's a there's a texture which is already selected. And uh, so basically, uh, as you can see, uh, when, whenever you draw uh, uh, the the y the y point of the coordinates, they map to uh, note in the select scale. So that's how uh, the music is played. And uh, the feedback is real time, which actually uh, helps you to like, use it as an instrument and like, actually uh, improvise with something else. And uh, people can uh, explore the scales, uh, the classical scales that are there uh, in, this, in this panel. And everything has, everything has a corresponding uh, visual change associated with it. Um, I could uh, do this and... And uh, the other, other part is uh, it also lets you uh, choose which sounds you want to make uh, with this instrument. So, uh, and that is also correlated with the, the vi one, one visual parameter on the canvas, which is the texture of the brush. So I could cha change the texture, and uh, it, it also changes the sound. And I can also use this uh, as a composition tool. Uh, by that, I mean uh, I can, I can uh, have the feedback as I draw, and I can also uh, play whatever I have composed. So, so yeah. So a person uh, who doesn't have a lot of uh, musical background, they can choose from the predefined scales. Uh, but somebody who is, a, is an advanced musician and they want to uh, customize what scale they want to play, what pitch collection they want to choose their notes from, they can also uh, just create the scales and uh, draw from that. So uh, yeah. So this is what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to move to another section. Um, so what are the mappings? Uh, as, I, as I already uh, mentioned, uh, wherever you draw, the y, the y axis uh, corresponds to the note uh, that is being played from the, from the uh, scale selected. And uh, whatever is being played, the timbre properties of that can be changed by uh, changing the brush, brush texture. Right? And uh, yeah, that, that's what the mappings are. And uh, I wanted to make it uh, easy uh, for people. Uh, so, yeah. So while I wanted to uh, give uh, the possibility of exploring different sounds in this uh, application, I also wanted to keep it easy for people to use it. And also, like, I wanted to uh, make sure that there's a visual correlation between the sound that people select. Uh, so the interaction, the kind of interaction that I wanted in this application was that uh, imagine a person uh, changes uh, the texture of the brush uh, smoothly or incrementally, like a, like a thinner to thicker brush. I, I would want the, the sound also to reflect that property. Um, 
And I didn't want to um, give the entire control uh, to the user. Uh, like I didn't want to overwhelm with them with the details of uh, customizing a synth or anything else. So uh, I, I generated some sounds uh, also, also just to add another uh, element of uh, exploration. Um, basically, uh, I used Google Magenta's GAN synth, uh, which is uh, the machine learning model that lets you um, generate acoustic sounds from a latent space of um, sp latent space built by training uh, several thousands of uh, acoustic instruments. Um, so I generated uh, two different sounds. One was percussive, which would point to a thinner brush te texture, and one was something like a wind-like instrument, uh, which would um, which would map to a thicker brush texture. And uh, basically generated a dozen of sounds which would um, interpolate between them. And as the brush texture changes, um, your sound also changes. So that, that's, the, that's the kind of interaction I wanted in this, uh, in this uh, application, so as to make it uh, really easy for people to explore different sounds. So uh, if you talk about the future possibilities, um, right now, um, Right now, when you, when, you, when you do a playback, uh, after you've drawn everything on the canvas, uh, it scans from left to right, um, which means that it's an XY, uh, XY playback method. And uh, I, would, I would like to explore uh, what a time-based playback would look like, so as to not just, not just play everything from left to right, but also like play as it was drawn on the canvas. So that's one of the things that I'm going to uh, uh, explore. And canvas stacking for long sequences, what that means. Um, so right now, there's a very short canvas uh, that people can work with, and which means that um, people who want to like, use it in a live, live setting, they might, uh, they might find it limiting. So I would want uh, multiple canvases which can be stacked serially or parallelly so as to give like, more, room for, uh, more room for experimentation. Uh, Real-time collaborating, maybe. Uh, and uh, uh, another, another use of machine learning I could uh, think of in this was, would be uh, not like a bit different from uh, sound synthesis, but uh, towards melody generation. Uh, so again, like Google Magenta project has another model called Music VAE, uh, which I can potentially use uh, to suggest uh, what are the nice representations on the canvas, uh, which would sound, sound uh, better than what user is drawing. So yeah. So um, where where do we stand with this? Um, um, I haven't done a lot of uh, user studies yet, uh, or given it to a lot of uh, musicians uh, for playing with. Uh, but I have given it to some visual artists and uh, my five-year-old nephew, and uh, my Airbnb host last night, and uh, they 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 kind of uh, got engaged with this uh, application and they found it uh, easy to like just play just sketch away and like play something random so uh, that's that's where it is right now and i'm hoping to actually like uh, work with some uh, musicians and uh, see where it goes um, hopefully it can be used somewhere and uh, if i have time i would love to uh, play some video of this is just like me uh, jamming with a backing track uh, and like just being the user of my own team. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's not that bad. <laughs> um, lastly, uh, it's live. Uh, you can uh, use this address to like play with play with it, and uh, it's also open source. So in case uh, somebody's like interested in seeing how it's implemented, um, or they want to like uh, send some pull requests to improve it, uh, which is, there is this room for a lot of improvements, uh, feel, free, feel free to, um, yeah, catch hold of me. Cool. Thanks. Do we have any? Do we have any questions for Ashish? Oh. Uh, why did you still didn't sign up for the jam session tomorrow? I can consider it now. <laughs> uh, 
Um, hi, thank you. Um, first of all, I really ap appreciate this um, any kind of project that <laughs> enables the this concept of musicking, as Norbert was mentioning earlier. Um, and about this project, from a more of interaction point of view, um, your input is, uh, I can describe it more like a continuous motion is based on, but but the output is mostly based on discrete pitches. So in other words, it's, I can describe it as more discontinuous. Yeah. So don't you think that it's a little bit counterintuitive, this input and output relationship? Um, yeah, I mean, if I, if I think about it, it is. Um, but um, I, I wanted to like uh, kind of uh, mimic uh, the classical instruments in a way, classical acoustic instruments. Um, I mean, I could also like uh, have a continuous wind instrument associated with it. But uh, I just wanted to so start simple, and uh, what, what, you, what you just said makes sense. Uh, maybe it could be an exploration, and we can like test it out with people, how, what, they, what they find better. Yeah, thanks. Uh, have you considered doing any MIDI out so that um, a sound design person can translate what they do in a DAW with another synthesizer or a piano? Right. So, so uh, the underlying uh, data structure that I use uh, is easily um, convertible to a MIDI-like uh, sequence. Uh, it's not there yet, uh, but yeah, I can, I can build that. But yeah, I've, I've thought about that. I'll ask one more. That's uh, I, I saw you made a decision not to put a grid on the thing and just leave it completely blank. And I was curious what your your ideas on that were. Right. So so uh, I I uh, the first uh, interaction that I wanted to uh, give the users was to like just paint away uh, and not be like boggled by other details. I I did think about uh, lining up a keyboard next to the canvas so that it's at least like mappable to the keys. Um, but yeah, I didn't want to like show any details. Maybe maybe uh, I could try that too with some people. Yeah. I but yeah, that was curious about what that was the rationale behind it. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Wonderful. as he uh, gets this pulled up. Um, our next presentation is going to be about Maya Util, an NPM package for bridging web audio with music theoretic concepts uh, by Tom Collins and Christian Coulomb. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm at University of York, and Maya and Christian is at University of California in Davis, and also Maya. So here's what I intend to present to you this afternoon. Uh, firstly, since I haven't been to Web Audio Conference for a couple years now, I thought I'd tell you what Maya was, um, and what we've been up to, and what our motivation is. Um, then I'll move on to specifically what the, the paper's about, a package called Maya Util, and then look at some uh, potential applications of it. I'll just put a quick plug in. We, the University of York, are currently recruiting PhD students, so if you're interested, uh, I'll put my email address up again at the end, please feel free to come and speak to me or email me, um, and we can discuss potential topics. OK, so what's Maya? Uh, it stands for Music Artificial Intelligence Algorithms. And if you look in the bottom right in kind of the right way, you could perhaps figure out M-A-I-A. -A. Um, that's the home page. It's a music cooperative, which is a way of saying it's a kind of a, a very left-wing type of um, business. Firstly, it doesn't make any money at the moment. Um, secondly, the, uh, the idea is essentially a, a, an exercise in the redistribution of, of wealth. So um, we are trying, from an academic point of view, to model how people are in myriad ways contributing to uh, pieces of music and songs, and then should 
that music ever make any money through advertising revenue, etc. We will have decent models in place for how to distribute that fairly, uh, especially when the music has been created collaboratively, uh, when it may have had some technological um, input in terms of the algorithms behind it as well. Um, but perhaps a simpler way of saying what we've done so far is that we've built some online spaces for collaborative creating, um, for sharing and for understanding of music. So what's the motivation? It's three part. Um, the first one is maybe self-explanatory, but I'll give you a quotation in a second. Music for all is one of my personal motivations. Uh, the second one is that um, I would put some money on the future of music being this kind of confluence of consumer and creator. Um, we've heard echoes of that already in the conference. And then um, lastly, from a, uh, a research point of view, I'm really interested in how people um, come to be good, quotation, <laughs> at uh, making music. Um, I was you know, quite good at imitating different composers when I studied music. Um, hundreds of students pass through and acquire expertise in that every year, either through instruction or through finding their own roots. So I'm kind of interested in how that happens. Um, and so one of the first things I'll show you is a web-based DAW that um, Christian and I and some students built specifically with that uh, aim of kind of trying to dig into the evolution of uh, music composition in mind. Anyway, music for all. If you don't know what I meant from the first quote, it's the idea that everybody, irrespective of material wealth and background, should have access to high quality music and audio technological experiences, which may lead to their intellectual and or social enrichment. The idea is not new. This isn't a typo. Um, this is from, um, it's not a quotation from this paper, um, but this is basically uh, someone from Victorian Britain saying, hey, we should teach music in schools. Um, in one of the presentations yesterday, we saw the second quote here, this kind of idea of democratization of audio development, and then something else I found on the topic, producer plus consumer equals prosumer. <laughs> so this is you know, the idea that it's not just a one-way pipeline nowadays, but all sorts of confusing and exciting things are going on in terms of creative flow. Um, here's, um, now this isn't, uh, a very nice looking interface, but what it will show you is the evolution, and it doesn't have any sound in this one, but the, the next bit will. <laughs> um, this is me grabbing someone's activity in a web-based DOW that I'll show you in a second, and basically speeding it up by a factor of 20, and you know, time is on the x-axis, MIDI note number is on the y-axis, all instruments or tracks are uh, projected onto the same grid, so it's a little bit messy. Uh, it comes from two people working on an EDM loop. Uh, I think in this experiment they worked on it for 20 minutes. But just to give you an idea of the type of data I can look at on the back end of the DAW. So I select participant, speed up factor, and now I'm looking at what they did and when. So it's a pretty brief example, um, and we can't play this in the moment yet, but for this kind of short content, you can kind of um, you know, just listen to the final thing and then kind of reverse infer what was going on in particular moments. What I noticed looking at these is there are kind of quite clear action and appraisal cycles. Um, and I've done a fair amount of EDM loop writing as well myself, but I never really reflected on how I did it, but you know, there's clear passages where they're listening either to themselves and what they've just done, or they're listening to their co-creator, and then this intense activity, which is the, you know, the action phase. Anyway, that's where I would like to go. Um, these are the um, students who two summers ago, maybe three now summers ago, helped Christian and I build it. Um, this is our main tester. Um, <laughs> Uh, the previous talk also mentioned family testers. It's a good source of testers. 
Um, and Christian wasn't pictured previously, but that's Christian there. We built it while I was working at Lehigh University in the US. Um, let's have a quick look at it now. Um, okay, so let's just risk reloading it. Uh, so you have login and stuff. I've called myself Wolfgang Gang Amadeus Muzak, um, but you don't have to be logged in to do stuff. And I'm just going to show you, I suppose let's go from here. It came with a break of day. Had to kind of clunky but you can do you know good stuff in in there um, if you want to have a quick um, play around with it um, oh I put a bitly link for this which has disappeared from the title um, let me just recreate one quickly maybe <laughs> so you can try and break it for a minute or two now if you like I'll just put it here so if you go to that bit.ly um, link it should redirect you to the page that I'm looking at right now and it's going to work either in Chrome or Firefox playback is broken in Chrome nobody bothered to fix the audio context error in Chrome um, but I don't necessarily want you to be playing it back on your own computers anyway right now. But um, there's somebody just joined. That's great. Um, I put some Radiohead in here. Uh, so we can start destroying it. <laughs> Yeah, the drum stuff is going to be down here. You can put drum stuff up there, but it was going to just create an error message. Can I add an instrument? All right, you get the idea. <laughs> Thank you for contributing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's Jam, uh, built by Maya. What's Maya Util? So, thank you. Um, so I'm 10 minutes in, Jesse. Okay. So there's all this exciting stuff going on, right? Loads of stuff going in, on in web audio, in music information retrieval, or MIR, uh, in music cognition, people doing a lot of stuff on you know, various experimental approaches to how people perceive music, but also developing computational models um, of those human um, behaviors and of the kind of neural functioning and then in, in computational music theory as well. So um, I don't, by putting my util here, mean that this is going to solve all <laughs> the problems and bring everything together and it's going to be great. It's in a way a very small contribution, um, but it can build bridges between some of these domains, as I will show in a second. Um, and we had a presentation from Luis earlier um, on Essentia JS, which to some extent might remove some of the need for me to think about these upper boxes, uh, upper circles, and I can just use Essentia JS to, to do some of the things which previously in some of these examples I will have done in offline using Python packages. But anyway, this is the main takeaway of the paper that we're trying to provide some glue or some bridges between these separately exciting domains. Uh, what is my util? Technically, uh, node package manager package. You can find it by searching my util on npmjs.com. Uh, um, if you want to use it server side or as a kind of JavaScript, JavaScript scripting language, which I do quite a lot, um, you know, just require it once you've installed it. Um, 
we'll get the latest version from here and copy it straight into something you can refer to on the client side. Why did we develop it? Christian and I and others have, you know, worked on a number of prototypes and then we just kept reusing stuff and it was getting annoying, so we packaged it up and the code isn't great <laughs> and it definitely needs a refactor, um, but we felt it was time to share um, back and, and see what other people made of it. So let's look at um, some of the things that you can do specifically with this package. Um, we use this um, quite a lot in Jam. Um, so to explain briefly what I mean by symbolic time conversions, musicians will tend to talk about things happening on certain measures in America, uh, bar in the UK, I'm not sure what the language is elsewhere, but you know, you've got like a bar and beat number where things are happening. Um, typically for analytical uh, or generative purposes, you don't necessarily care about bar and beat numbers, you want an incrementing measure of time starting at zero for bar one, beat one, and just going up and up and up, but you don't necessarily want to store um, duplicate information uh, or information that can be can calcul calculated from other information on your database. So, you know, converting between these is something we do a lot. Um, it assumes that you have one or more time signatures. Um, um, so, like, you know, if you've got four, four time, and that's, that's all that happens, because you may be doing EDM, um, then that's a very simple variable that looks something like this. Bar number one starts in four, four time. That's it. Um, but if you're doing something where the time signature changes, for example, here, then um, we might need to manage that a bit more carefully in terms of figuring out where this starts. It's easy to see it's like bar one, two, three, four, beat, not beat one, but beat one and a half. So bar four, beat one and a half. Um, and so what you can do with the utility package is kind of send that information in with the time signatures variable, and you'd get out the answer 10 there. Or you can go the other way around, send in 10, and get out the answer of bar and beat. So that's a very basic one. Something slightly more exciting, um, take audio as input, use somebody else's multi-F0 beat tracking algorithm, quantize the stuff that's coming from that, and then do all manner of things. The point of this slide and this particular application is that you essentially cross that audio symbolic divide, right? And so you can do really exciting things when those two worlds can talk to one another most ordinarily in the audio to symbolic direction, and then you live there. Um, but potentially you could go back the other way as well, I guess. Um, so I will maybe gloss over the technical details of what's there for that, but just show you the web-based um, demo of it. I used Free Music Archive, um, Scrape from 2016, uh, Multi-F0 from Hawthorne et al., beat tracking from Krebs. I did that offline. It's important to say that because the demo makes it look a bit like it's happening in real time, but it isn't. Um, so let's start with this super simple one. Turn it down. For just an ascending guitar scale, you can see how good or not the multi F0 estimation and beat tracking is there. And then what I'm just showing here are some histograms that are calculated in real time, showing the distribution of on times across the bar and then MIDI note number material here. Uh, I can maybe look at one slightly more complex one. I didn't. I need to tidy this up um, and, and give a student credit who worked on it. Um, but this is a you know a more elaborate um, piece of music here. All right, that's probably enough of that one. Um, so. The main other thing I've done is provide some ways that you can not annoy musical users. Does anyone want to tell me what's wrong with this? Yeah, yeah it should be B-flat. So if you, if, if you recognize that, then, um, then great. If you didn't, then you know, we're perhaps also misleading people who are trying to learn about music. Um, 
whether or not you would actually say, okay, this is in F major and put F major in the key signature is, you know, to, to be debated, but the context is probably F major and this should be a B flat. So that's one other thing that's in there. It's quite complex how you do that, but the research is quite old. You know, there's like cognitive algorithm for key estimation and then, you know, already over a decade old uh, algorithm for pitch spelling. I actually implemented something simpler than this one, but it uses something that Meredith talks about, which is the morphetic pitch number. And I think that's probably worth pausing on because what we know when someone plays something in is the MIDI note numbers they're playing, right? And that's why we will misspell sometimes B flat as A sharp or vice versa, depending on the context. Meredith points out that there's this bijection between a morphetic pitch number, which is numeric height on the stave. Once you know that and the MIDI note number, you can unambiguously get the pitch class and the octave. And in the other direction, if you know these two things, you can get these two things. So there's something in there as well for that. Uh, and then what I wanted to show you there was kind of putting that together. Um, we can do kind of instantaneous uh, key estimation and visualization. So it's making me a gray triangle at the moment because I'm not playing anything, but if I start... Try and do some G major stuff here. We'll get a G major color key. If I switch to A flat... A flat longer than you played G major for, the blue will kind of ascend to the top of the hierarchy. So I will, I will kind of bring it to a close. Um, future work is slots. Um, if anyone's interested in playing Muse, Muse in the jam, I like Muse. Um, thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. All right, do we have any questions? I wanted to go back to that very beginning where you had that demonstration where the, the, you've watched people compose mm. and you had the pauses that, that really meant that they were listening, reflecting, or thinking. And I was just curious what your thoughts are about that. And when you did the jam together, it was kind of a similar situation. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Um, I mean, part of it might be to do with the fact that it was looping music, and so you were forced, if you wanted to kind of wait to hear something, you had to wait. So I suppose it makes sense to also try this in a, you know, like a compositional setting where you're either limiting people's ability to loop it or you specifically tell them you can only play from the beginning to try and tease out the difference you know, th th that th that might be creating. Um, but yeah, I, I think basically what people are doing, and I haven't really noticed myself doing this when I compose, but I think you know, they are listening and then they're having a burst of... Do you, do you feel like the collaborative thing. side of things interferes with that? Yes, that's a good question actually. So if I use the drop down menu and pick a solo, effort, which we ran in the same experiment, we see the same uh, quite distinct. Uh, so yeah, that, that's there irrespective of the collaboration, but I'm not sure in terms of quantitative measures whether the collaboration increases that. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have one more presentation uh, in the session, and it is Interference, Adapting Player Music Interaction in Games to a Live Performance Context. So let us welcome uh, Matthew Wang. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, so today I'll be talking about something, a project I worked on as an undergraduate last year at Princeton. Um, 
as my senior thesis, it's a, essentially a web music game, multiplayer music game, uh, specifically designed for live performance um, and specifically for the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, although it's also sort of evolved into something as a web application that is accessible to anyone uh, just to sort of be played with for fun uh, and just for music making, for also music making for non-musicians sort of thing. Um, yeah, and also just a bit about me. I'm, again, graduated last year from Princeton and now I'm working uh, in the music department there as a computer music and electronic music researcher. So, yeah, I'll start just a bit talking about uh, game music concepts that are relevant to this project. Um, moving on to then how I'm sort of adapting some of those to live performance, then the application of the web technologies that I'm using. And I'd like to demo um, the actual application, hopefully including some of you guys. And I'll just talk about a little bit of future ideas. Um, probably not for the specific project, but with this general sort of structure and concept in mind. Okay, so game music, um, if you want to just think of a game very generally as player interaction with a set of rules or objectives, whatever those may be, it doesn't necessarily have to be digital, although I'm sort of specifically thinking of video games in this context. Um, and then game music, therefore, is music which is generated or assembled according to the state of that game, the actions of its players, and so on. Um, this necessarily means that game music itself is dynamic and changeable, um, which I'm sure is a concept that sort of no one, no one, everyone here is quite familiar with. Um, but then there's also the major consideration of like what is the uh, relationship between the player and the music, sort of what role is the music performing? Is it sort of an emotional um, enhancement of whatever else is going on non-musical in this game? Um, how is the player meant to listen to the music? Are they actually sort of participating in creating it, or are they just a passive listener and it's a sort of background thing? And also then, who or what is the perceived performer of the music? Is the player sort of meant to feel that they're actually performing the music, or is it something in the game? And those are all sorts of important things to consider, especially for this sort of live performance context. So, um, the main sort of way of thinking about that last problem, which is at the core of this um, that I've been working with, is this idea of proactive and reactive sort of musical forces. And that comes from this article, um, Interactivity and Music in Computer Games. Right, so proactive music is the idea of music which um, influences player action in a game in a very direct way, sort of demands a specific response from, a pl from players. Um, and it's largely independent of intentional player input. Um, I have some images here of games you may or may not know. Sort of Guitar Hero is like the archetypical music rhythm game. Um, and that's very much proactive music where there's a track playing, essentially regardless of what the player is doing outside of just some menu options way ahead of time. Um, and you are meant to, as a player, respond rhythmically to it. Um, and then in sort of the non-music game world, there's um, things like combat music or in such as um, the Metal Gear Solid series, which is a stealth game. There's different audio and musical cues to suggest when you've been seen and then demand the sort of response of, you know, hide. Uh, and on the flip side of this, there's reactive music, which um, indirectly because obviously sort of a player themselves can't directly create sound with the game system. Um, a player is interacting with a game system which then produces this music reactively to whatever the player input is. Um, so it's determined by the gameplay independent on player input. And those sorts of examples could be anything from something like um, in The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, literally playing an instrument in game um, or more typically is things like when you are changing an area in a game. So this is a screenshot from a, on the bottom here from a Pokemon game. And if you enter sort of a new area, then it just changes whatever musical track is going on. Yeah, just those are sort of the two here. You'll see with these diagrams, there's sort of the player and game, I think, are sort of a very fixed unit in the context of games where there's interaction, again, between a player and a set of rules and objectives. And then there's 
really the main difference between proactive and reactive is just how uh, the music actually relates to um, player action. So something that arises out of these two sorts of musics um, in games is sort of a feedback loop between the player and the music. So when you combine proactive and reactive music, uh, you get this feedback loop uh, whereby, for example, if a player commits to some action that then results in a reactive music, for example, going into a new area in a game, and then this music, um, you know, it's like very scary or something that is in the form a uh, proactive music that then may demand some response from the player, such as leave this area that you just entered. Um, and if you have certain relationships, you can end up in a feedback loop whereby um, the response that uh, the game, the music demands from the player then causes further player action that causes more music which demands further action from the player. So this is something that definitely exists in games, but it's oddly enough not really present in music games. Music games typically have feature mostly a one directional sort of thing. So again, thinking of Guitar Hero or other rhythm games, it's almost all proactive music. And then there's also some other music oriented games that, um, such as, I don't know if anyone's heard of like Electroplankton, that's sort of the popular one, where it's very much a music making game, um, but there's not so much music that you're necessarily responding to as a player. Um, so I'm sort of thinking, how can I design a music game, essentially, for performance that takes these both, creates a feedback loop, and uh, you know, uses that for the, to drive um, a musical piece and performance. Yeah. So, thinking about adapting this to live performance, um, I essentially want to create a music-focused game, which is a combination of proactive and reactive music to establish player music feedback. And, of course, there's certainly problems involved with this. There is a reason that most music games have more of a one-directional relationship between the player and the music. Um, First of all, just being maintaining that feedback can be difficult when the focus is on the music in the sense that um, a player is less inclined to feel they should respond to something if they feel like they're also the source of it, um, which you know, is just sort of an odd uh, thing there. So there's different ways to solve this problem. Um, for my specific case, um, I essentially decided to implement uh, my game is a multiplayer structure so that, um, you know, a player is not responding to whatever music they've generated themselves, but they're responding to the music, um, the whole sort of congregate music, right, um, of all of the players. And this also sort of fits in very well to my specific case of designing this for live performance by an ensemble. Um, and it's also sort of worth pointing out that this sort of multiplayer structure is in many ways similar to traditional like open, pro open improvisation structures where sort of people are, it's very much about listening just as much as playing. Um, of course, then there's this other problem in a game context as opposed to open improvisation uh, where there are non-musical objectives sort of driving things forward. Um, so there's an issue of balancing the roles of player of a game and performer, um, essentially not letting, trying to not let one role sort of take over, where as a performer of music, you are ignoring the objective of the game, or as a, the player of, a, of the game, you are ignoring the musical aspects, and it sort of becomes uninteresting. Um, this is sort of the more difficult of these problems, perhaps. Um, and very generally, the solution is just to, as tightly as possible, tie game objectives and elements to musical objectives and elements. <coughs> All right, so I'll talk a bit now just about my about actual web audio uh, and implementation. Uh, sort of, why did I decide to make this a web-based application? Uh, I originally didn't uh, necessarily plan on having it be web-based. I had, did not before this project have much experience with web audio or um, web technologies, but um, 
after becoming aware of some tools and, and such that were available, it, it made sense as an option. Um, so importantly, it's sort of web, it, it's very nice how accessible web things are, not just for live performance, but also to anybody. Um, it's very convenient that's centralized on a server. It's very easy to update as opposed to, say, a max patch. Um, I don't need to constantly resend out every time I want to update to everyone who's performing the piece. And then also, again, existing tools. Um, I'm using here a cloud hosting service, um, Heroku platform, Node.js for the overall framework, Socket.io connection, um, and then a game multiplayer game framework called Lance, um, Tone.js for audio, and Sync, which is a um, node package from Soundworks, um, which was also presented in the Web Audio Conference in 2016 in Atlanta, and that's for sort of precise synchronization since I'm using sort of a sequencer model here. Just to go quickly sort of through the general structure of how these things are put together, there's essentially the server engine running uh, constantly. A client makes a request for a connection and a room name, the client um, basically consisting of a sync client, which is a sort of a clock, and then the uh, Tone.js sound engine. So make a request for a room name, the server creates a room and a sync server um, for so that uh, synchronization is strictly um, encapsulated to that room. The room sends back um, confirmation of that and necessary player and game info to that client. And then it's sort of resolved to the state where the client is constantly sending um, input and events to the server to be processed and the, pro the server is sending synchronized um, information about the game state and events and other players and everything. Uh, and if you have multiple rooms and players, you sort of end up with a structure that looks like this. Okay, so I'd like to quickly try to demo this with some of you guys. Um, it doesn't necessarily scale that well with like tons of people, so maybe if the first four or five rows or so, if there's anyone who would like to try it out, um, just go to this link here, preferably using Chrome. I think audio works in Firefox, but there's some graphical issues, um, so yeah. And I'll just wait a bit before leaving this slide. Okay. Uh, hopefully, okay, cool. Uh, that's a pretty good number of people. <laughs> So you should be able to see um, just very basic controls and what, how to actually sort of play the game on your screen. Um, yeah, and just I'll start it, and well, people will not be able to join after I start it, just so you know. Um, we can kind of see how it goes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you'll want to hit V, probably, just so you can see what's going on. Um, oh, sorry. One sec. I uh, wonder why I'm having issues starting it. Sorry, one moment. Can I start if I'm... Okay. I wonder if there's too many people. <laughs> Again, it doesn't scale quite well. So I apologize. Um, but maybe if a few people could sort of just disconnect <laughs> uh, until there's maybe, you know, around 10 here then hopefully that'll work. Huh. It's odd that it works in another room, but not this one. All right. Uh, yeah, it seems for some reason I can't start this, although for some reason I can start it in another room. I'm not sure why that might be, but uh, that's okay. I have video, sort of. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> that's Jeff. He advised me on this project. He's very, very helpful. <laughs> yeah. So maybe if a, yeah, a few people, like two or three, could join um, WAC two, maybe. <laughs> okay. And I'll just try from here. Okay. So if you turn up your uh, volume as well. 
sort of these, these balls that go around and they uh, produce drones and you can place notes in synchronized sequencers by pressing space when they're sort of in your view. And I can zoom in on my specific view here. Yep, sorry. Um, there's this sort of thing. And then there's this sort of movement thing. This is actually how you play the game. Um, you're meant to sort of paint over everyone else's space. Uh, there's sort of different harmonic uh, fields that are attached to each color and so on, and eventually the objective is to cover everyone's space with the same color, and that's sort of the whole progression of the game. All right, um, I'll just quickly close just sort of talking about potential future work with this. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, so definitely with my particular invitation, I think uh, there isn't that much of a connection between the player and performer roles. Um, it's definitely easy to get caught up as a player of the game and not so much concerned with the music. Uh, so it's definitely there's some thinking to do about really how to connect those better. I think there's also the possibility of doing a fully audio-based game without any sort of visuals. Um, there's definitely with audio worklets um, a lot of potential for really flexible dynamic synthesis uh, based on the game parameters. Um, and then I also like to sort of think about uh, how, instead of applying these sort of game concepts to live performance, but how to apply sort of these live music performance concepts to sort of social gaming contexts and also sort of, which is also then sort of related to music jam sort of uh, contexts. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Any questions? Thank you, Matthew. Um, interesting work. And I, I just wanted to come back to the kind of binary that you were talking about between player and performer. Right. Um, and I guess I'm wondering whether it's even a necessary consideration. Um, I mean, we were just having some discussion at lunchtime about making interactive dance works and working in the studio with the dancers making the work so that in the end, the things couldn't be separated. The music and the interaction and the choreography were essentially the same thing. And I'm wondering whether just changing the mindset on the design intention there changes the way that you think about the design of the interaction where those things are no longer separate. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I'd certainly agree the ideal is in design is, certain, is for those roles to be the same, there, that there is no separation. Um, I think it can be sometimes difficult to think exactly of, in design, a, a game and a music system that really mesh that well. Um, no, but that's a very good point and perhaps sort of starting at that point, thinking of those roles as a single thing is, uh, is useful. All right, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up this session. We'll be able to take a little bit of a break after an announcement. Um, <laughs> and then we'll be uh, meeting back up at three. But here you go. Okay, so Another announcement, just to say that now it's time for a coffee break and pastries for 10 minutes, and then there is a new session on demos, posters, sponsors, and if you haven't seen the hours, go and see them, because today is the last day, and you have this, a couple of hours to do so, and then we move for, uh, to the banquet. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.